You're listening to Music Mythology. My name is Sam Romo, and let's talk about some music. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. So jazz. Jazz. Awesome. Mm. That's a good one. So uh, this is Sam Romo sitting down with uh, Deep Perfect Gabriel. Yeah, Gabriel's good. Awesome. Gabriel Parker. So how you doing, brother? I'm doing great, man. Awesome. How about yourself? Doing well, brother. Good. Awesome. So where do you want to start? Man, uh, well, first of all, how's your year been going? It's been weird. Yeah, same. <laughs> I think that's the only word you can use to describe this year, no I, matter what perspective you're coming from. <laughs> I definitely think it'd be weirder if you were like, oh, it's been great. Yeah. It's the best year ever. I mean, this project has been the silver lining, but it's, you know, it's just been too much weird. <laughs> yeah, a lot of weird to cause people to, to I guess, go for the silver, silver lining, right? Yeah. Yeah, it takes well, people out of their nice comfortable routines yeah, well, yeah people better have had things to be thankful for this year <laughs> <laughs> i'm surprised that they still had like open to the public black friday shopping you know target walmart they still had the deals they still had you know the stores open up at nine ten o'clock in the morning maybe five six or maybe even midnight yeah you know gotta make the money yeah i guess so there's a lot of businesses <laughs> that go into black at this point oh uh, that's weird can you get a little closer on it? Sure. Awesome. But yeah, dude, it's been a weird year, but it's just, again, it's just that time when it, things are constantly changing. You look at what you can control, look what you can, you can do and look what you can appreciate so you can stay focused on the things you can do. Man, ain't that the truth. <laughs> right. Have you caught COVID yet? No. No? I haven't. Okay. I did. Yeah. Yeah. I had that. How yeah. was that? Oh man, it was, um... You know, I, I honestly think I had it twice. Um, once after I came back from Hawaii in early December, uh, around the time where they were starting to talk about it. I know they were talking about it in like last year of November uh, was oh, when really? I was hearing it about it. But December, I went on a trip to Hawaii, played a gig out there. And then uh, when I was coming back, maybe a couple of days later after I got really sick, um, you know, fatigue and I was throwing up and I was uh my breathing was awful. I already have asthma, mm. but my breathing was worse than I could have ever imagined. I thought that I was just getting old and getting sick and this is what it's like. So I'm going to die by the time I'm 35, like my ancestors back in the fucking 1700s or some shit. But no, uh, I really do believe that was COVID. And then the mm. second time, uh, my roommate actually gave it to me. I'm not going to say any names so nobody incriminates him, but, um, my roommate gave it to me and then he told me his girlfriend got was sick. So she was getting tested and then he got tested. And then I think it was a weekend. It was on a Sunday. I found out that he had it. So mm. then I went and got tested and then I found out I had it. So I stayed out of work in the public for three weeks at that point. Mm. And that was early June. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and that second time, did you get anything? The second time was not as bad. I still coughed, uh, quite, you know, every once in a while. Um, I lost my sense of taste and smell oh, this, that time. Really? Yeah. Had it, had it come back? All oh, the way? yeah. It definitely came back. Oh, good. But That's it was, good. it was some weird. We're still struggling with that. Yeah, exactly. Some, you know, um, eating was awful because everything tastes the same. So the only thing you have is texture. Mm. So, you know, you want something like crunchy. You don't want something mushy. mushy. Yeah. It's going <laughs> to fuck you up a little bit. Yeah. It's gross. Yeah. It yeah. sucks. All the sensations been removed from eating. <laughs> all of it. All the satisfactory things. You don't smell it. You don't taste it. You don't, you know, huh. yeah. Well, then let's talk about something more sensational. Mm. <laughs> okay. Uh, have you seen any virtual shows or live streams of music lately? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, the only one I really watched was uh, the um, Deep Elm Art Company. Okay. Have you ever watched them? Yeah. Uh, just, you know, random jam bands and, mm -hmm. and people. Um, you know, I, I, I still work full time. Um, and then in my spare time, it's like I work 
I work on this a lot in the podcast and, um, and jamming like before I'd say before what's a couple months ago now, like September, I guess mm-hmm. I was really focused on, on the band. Like we were practicing pretty frequently cause none of us were seeing people. We didn't have anything really going on. You know, this is middle of the summer or whatever, or I guess it was before the summer when we really started the work because COVID kind of, you know, put a gap between us. Cause we, we used to perform or, or practice once a week constantly. Right. We, were, we were on a, a good little schedule mm-hmm. for at least like two or three years, something like that. And then when, um, uh, cat's going crazy in the background. Um, and then, uh, when COVID started, uh, we, we just stopped. We just put, put a break, put a pause on it and we didn't see each other. I mean, I don't know, a couple months, yeah. which is weird. Sounds about right. And then I guess it was the beginning of the summer when we started to feel, you know, like let's, let's stay distance, but let's see each other and whatever. And then we started practicing again. Um, and then, man, it felt like nothing ever happened. I mean, in fact, when we came back together, I felt like we were better than, you know, the last few times that we had practiced before. And I think it was, we kind of got in that groove of the expected, you know, we were kind of like, ah, we'll just, why do we need to work so hard right now? Yeah. We'll just, we'll jam again next week. Maybe mm. we can do it next week. Oh. I'm like, all right, sure. And then now when it was taken away and we come back together and it was full force, like, oh man, I've been practicing this. What have you been doing? Oh, yeah. I got this. I'm like, oh, awesome. <laughs> And within that first night, I mean, I think we played for like six hours, like straight, just recording stuff and going crazy. And can you hear yourself? Yeah. I can't hear myself at all. You can't hear yourself at all. Oh man, did he just unplug it? Uh, I think he's. I think you unplugged it, mate. I think you fucked up. <laughs> you unplugged. Yes, you. Looking up at the ceiling. There. Can you hear me now? I can't hear you. Okay, great. Excellent, Freaking cat. <laughs> so that's the first time he's been so rambunctious. Rambunctious. That's a good word. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so so yeah, so when we when we came back together, I because I I guess I had come up with the you know like the podcast name and general. Content concept like the beginning of this year and and i just been working on it like workshopping um logos uh you know what kind of social posts i would do how i would reach out to people just the, the background stuff and uh um but then I knew I, I wasn't going to be able to really flesh it out because of how things were. So mm. I was just kind of sitting on it, okay. working on it. Um, and so when we were able to get back together, I was just all in. I was like, let's get together. I have a soundboard. I'll buy, you know, a percussion, um, a drum kit mic set, get that wired up. I have mics for each of the guitars and everything. And uh, we'll just start taking it more seriously because the first round was already pretty damn good after we came back together after those after that break and so we got serious again we would get together um once a week you have 30 demos now yeah we have more but those are just the ones that i've leveled and mixed a little bit and just cleaned them up just a little bit so you can kind of get an idea of what the the song was will be because we still need to flesh a lot of them out and add some stuff um other instruments in the background and stuff like that but um but that's what we I put a lot of work into this year for the most part was let's record and then you know we're recording just jams and and just throwing out ideas and doing that for five to six hours and then the following week I'm literally just listening through all of it and just like taking notes so like oh that's a good one um you know at one minute 32 seconds we need to repeat that that's a good measure let's let's save that but move it over to this one maybe and that's what I was working on like constantly um and it felt good because like I said in high school that's that's what I studied I studied audio engineering and and video production and it felt good to dive back into that because it just felt so familiar um mean, to work on my own stuff you know like that was just that was much much more um entertaining or, or just felt really worthwhile. You know, I'm not working on some random person that contracted me to do something or whatever. Um, I'm working on it for, for the group, for me or exactly. whatever. And know. I'm sure you, you really like the group, right? Yeah. Yeah. You like, you love these people inside and outside the music and, you know, playing with music with them is not only fun, but it's so worthwhile afterwards. Right. Um, you know, even if, um, uh, Like I know, for instance, there's always an opportunity for a lot of people to go uh, play with somebody way bigger than themselves who have a big following, you know, uh, for most for most dedicated musicians, they will, you know, you will get an opportunity where you get that chance to go play with somebody, maybe for one show or a jam or a tour. Right. Um, But to 
to to be able to play music and perform music with people that you genuinely enjoy being around in and out go eat with them go chill yeah. with them man that's such a gift oh yeah it's, and it's a different kind of connection it's yeah like because especially and i'm not shortchanging any anything here but like with my brother-in-law like I don't know what it is. And I mean, with all of them, I can, we just, we just click, you know, we know what's going on and we know each other's little nuances and it's like, what, like to some people that would be weird timing or a weird little change up, but it's like, Oh, I know what you're doing. You know, like we just know each other so well. And, uh, but it's particularly like with my brother-in-law, we always make that comment because like, mm-hmm. he's the bass man. And, and for the most part for this last year, I've been the drummer and, um, uh, and it's just awesome, man. I mean, it, it's it, that cohesion, you know, with a confidant, with someone that you, you know, through and through and the music, you know, each other, you right. know, it's like another world. And it's like, Oh man, you get my mind, mm-hmm. you know, and that's beautiful. Um, yeah. And that's what kept us coming back, you I know, have to whether say anything to them or anything like that. Yeah. Just tell him what, what, what key I'm in and show a little bit and then he gets it. You yeah. know, it's not very hard for mm-hmm. us to get, to get it, you know, to get each other. And it's beautiful. Isn't but, it? Yeah. How yeah. Much, uh, it's uh like uh the language of it too where some of it is is spoken and some of it is un, is unspoken mm. but it seems to be only a language that people who have taken the time to kind of learn it can really understand almost like kind of like coding or math um, sure. um you try to tell it to somebody that is not musically educated in any manner, shape or form. And some of the most basic things that, you know, like, Oh, if I just spend a lot of, a little bit of time, I'll understand this. Some of the basic things trying to understand, talk talk to people about it. It just goes on deaf ears or it goes over their head. You know, they're like, I don't know what you mean by a scale, seven notes. What are you talking about? Mm. You know? And, um, I think that's one of, and this, I hope this doesn't sound elitist or anything, but the, 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 exclusivity of of uh the enjoyment of music on a deeper level it's so nice especially when you run into somebody else who enjoys music as much as you do or similarly uh having a conversation about the nuances instead of like oh man i really like the beat i like the beat you know the beat sounds great Mm. you know you'd say something else besides i like the beat right yeah yeah it's like you yeah, especially when you're super passionate about it because you, you, you dive deep. I mean, uh, I mean, like when you're a super nerd, I mean, nerd's just someone that's, that's passionate about something. And, and if you nerd out on an artist or a genre or an art style, you, you, you go in deep and you find those, you discover those nuances, you learn them, you, you pick up on the things that you realize you, you are drawn to. And then just, just through listening, everybody has those habits, especially those, those music lovers, those heavy audio files and stuff like that. But then when you're a musician, there's just that, you know, there's another level of appreciation Especially when you're listening to someone playing what you normally play. Right. <laughs> that's when you feel like the smallest person in the room. Sometimes you're like, oh my God, what oh the my hell God. just happened? We should. Sure? <laughs> I, I don't know. Sometimes I hear people who play my instrument. I'm like, I don't play this person's instrument. Uh, this guy plays a whole nother kind of horn than I do. Mm. You know, I, I not really. I know it's a trumpet, you know, right, right. Uh, but. You know, some people, some people just make it sound way or just expand the sounds of it all. Um, yeah. They make it huge or they make it small or they do both in the same song. And um, man, it's, it's it's amazing. And everybody's got their own flavor. And you can kind of if you really listen to a whole bunch of people, you can kind of set a whole bunch of records next to each other, play them and probably pick who you're listening to just from what they're doing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know drummers. That's a, that's a big one, you know, hearing a drummer and being like, Oh yeah, no, no, this is uh, buddy rich or, uh, this is, um, this is Art Blakey. This is, um, uh, Neil Peart or, you know, whoever. Yeah. Then. Yeah. And, and, and those types of personalities, they have their, they, their personalities and their character leak into their styles. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is their style. Right? right. And, 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 and that's what you get drawn to. And you're like, Oh yeah, that's, that, that's how I can tell it's monk is, yeah. is how, what he's doing or, or, and I know there's, especially the more, the classics, they have their, their niches, the things that they were known for, but I mean, that's, that's what you fall in love with is, is their different path of music is what they, they chose to work on or what they chose as a, as their niche, as their, as their, the cherry on top I'm like, I'm, I'm good, but watch this. Mm-hmm. I'm going to change it up. And then you're not, you're not going to know what that is. You oh, know? Thelonious was great at that. Yeah. That's what he was about. I know when I'm learning a new, uh, 
when I'm trying to sing a new jazz tune, mm. um, I'll try to listen to instrumentalists. I know the instrumentalists, instrumentalists will listen to a vocalist mm. and try to understand what it is to make the instrument sing. Uh, but as an instrumentalist and a vocalist, I tend to go to uh, instruments to kind of hear how things are supposed to sound or maybe how different nuances. Uh, uh, maybe you you change the note on the four uh or some people change the note on the three or some people don't change the note until the one of the next measure. Mm. Try not to burp on the camera, <laughs> this ranch water. Um, but anyways, <laughs> here, actually let's take a quick little yeah. break. Let me, <laughs> but, um, yeah, Thelonious would, man, he knew how to, how to fuck some shit up. So there's, um, there's a classic standard called uh, body and soul. And so when I was working on understanding how to sing uh, body and soul, I went to Thelonious. And so I would listen to Thelonious mm. maybe like an hour a day for a week trying to understand how to how to get that nuance. And he would play every single harmonic option you could possibly mm. think of uh, with Thelonious, you know, from from your nice safes, one, three, fives and sevens to your, you know, sharp nines, your elevens and thirteens and put all these strange um, harmonic options out there. And obviously, a sane person's not going to pick all these harmonic options to <laughs> sing or perform or anything. He was insane. But, um, you know, you can pick and choose. You're like, oh, but you can you can do that right there. Mm. Maybe you can do that right here. Kind of kind of like um, a production, you know, or you listening back six hours, five, six hours being like, oh, well, you know, I like this here. This can repeat right here. Right. And it's all about um, it's all about. Kind of like how you guys recorded a whole five, six hours of, of jamming. Um, you can do that with Thelonious because he kind of just puts years and years of, of knowledge in one song. Mm. And then you can go back and you're, you're like, oh, well, you know, I, I want to sing it like this. I hear how he does this. I don't like this, but I like this. I think this should be put here. And then if we can go back and do this so I can do that, what he did right there. And that's what I particularly like uh, the thought of Monk just kind of like just switching things up and, and giving people a chance to be themselves. He's, he's really much so like a like a jazz manual for the mm. soul, you know. Wait, and why, why do you say that like that? Just the just the the choices like he, any kind of manual is going to. It, depending on what kind of thing you're you're operating with, mm. like for instance, I have a uh, I have a drone, right? And you okay. can do so many things with a drone within the scope of right, drones. Right. You can make it float and sit there. You can drive it forward. You can drive it back. You can let it go out and then set a command to where you know fifteen percent, and then it comes to you. Mm. Um, and it's kind of the same way in jazz, except a lot more blown up you know it's like oh i can i can be super feisty and fierce i can be very mysterious and mm. i can i can do whole tones and i can do um you know i can sound like i'm i'm from like a what's the word um exotic lands you know i can do harmonic minors and make it sound you know what i feel like an egyptian sound would sound like mm. uh, i can i can really make it soulful and add some, some, um, some harmonic blues in there, some, some, uh, minor blues or some, um, pentatonic scales in there. You know, I can, I can be very Western centric and stick to my majors and minors and mm. do everything in the, in the Western hemisphere of acceptable music, or I can learn something else mm. and go more towards the Eastern hemispheric style of music. And I, I always felt like, uh, Thelonious was open to all of those things as a, as a jazz musician versus, other people, uh, including Miles, which I think Miles had a huge ear as well. Mm. Yeah. Oh, or yeah. Sun Ra, if you've ever heard Sun Ra. No. It's like, uh, you know, Kamasi Washington. Yeah. All right. So Kamasi Washington does a lot of like space jazz, right? Right. The big and, epic stuff. Yeah. Very big epic stuff. Um, but Sun Ra was that Kamasi Washington before mm. Kamasi. What so, era was he in? Man, like 60s through 80s. Okay. Yeah. You make these yeah. big epics of like, um, 
just open open jazz sounds makes you feel like you're you're just drifting and floating it wasn't boring but it was uh it was very um I want to say eclectic. Kind of like trance-like? Yeah, trance-like. Mm. Trance-jazz. Yeah. Yeah, trance-jazz. Yeah. Uh, see, I, and I, I've mentioned this before, but, like, my, my favorite, like, era of music is, like, that 60s, 70s era. Because, I mean, you just find so much... I mean, you find the roots of everything, like, in there. I mean, obviously, there's the roots go further than that, but people start fusing things. They start really mixing things up because mm. you're not... Because more and more artists are becoming less and less controlled by labels. Mm -hmm. You know, they're either, they have their own success, so they're going to make their own, like the Beatles, or they're going to, uh, or like at the height of the 60s and the in the 70s, I mean, the youth was controlling the market. They were buying so much music that now they were the, the leaders. It wasn't the old people leading the trends anymore. And, and with that, there's a lot of turmoil, there's a lot of weirdness, but you get those cross, you get that cross stuff where, where, you know, well, that was the beauty. I mean, especially for the, the Beatles and, and any of those artists that started to introduce new things is they, they, they reached out to other genres. They started learning from other people. And I mean, even like, um, I mean, like, did you know that? In 1970, Miles Davis was playing to make an album um, and include, which I think would eventually, it, it fizzled out, but it became uh, Bitches Brew. But he was originally going to include Hendrix and uh, M Paul McCartney on it. Mm. He wanted Hendrix to play the guitar portions and Paul to do the bass. And it was because they, they knew each other, you know, and they they, they dug each other. Yeah. And and they wanted to, to do that, you know, because McCartney did that all the time. Mm -hmm. and And I mean, that's... I just love that because I mean it's like you're chasing the love of music. You're just chasing like the next sound, the new sound. It's like it's not just competitive. It's uh, it's it's like a, a internal passion competition with yourself of like I didn't, I don't know what's next, but I want to make it. Yeah, I want to, I want to just throw it together. Yeah, which is why I also enjoy Kanye. Um, when he's on a good, good focus stream, I, yeah. I enjoy what Kanye kind of represents, which is always the, um, the search for the new sound. Mm. He's always that, um, I want to say hip hop artist, but he's, he's much more than that. Um, at this point, oh, yeah. uh, maybe when he was first starting with his first three albums, but, um, he, he always kind of reaches for the sounds outside of the of the normal hip hop uh, idiom. Uh, he doesn't he doesn't always pick the boom, boom baps. Uh, he went for the more uh, chic kind of vogue uh, instrumentals that he would craft or at least be over uh, the choices for him. When you see eight, when you hear 808s mm -hmm. or when you hear uh, some of the music towards the end of graduation, you kind of hear that where his uh, ears were going, especially listening to 808s and then going back to graduation. You're like, oh, okay, this transition was already starting to happen. Yeah. Thanks to, you know, people like Kid Cudi. Um, you kind of, you kind of saw that. And you, then you see that sound again now uh, with Tyler, the creator's Igor. Mm, you kind of, yeah. you kind of get more of that uh, and fashion Boy. show. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So Big mix up cross genres, but that was always something that, yeah, definitely attracted the me to Kanye was his, his sampling, his production work always incorporated multiple genres, multiple eras. You know, he's going to sample this old, uh, uh, Gil Scott Heron song or part and, 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 and or, or, uh, Curtis Mayfield, mm -hmm. you know, he's all over the place, but, um, even rare earth, you know, just picking random stuff that he grew up with that he, he heard heard and was obsessed with, right. you know, but he appreciated it. Mm -hmm. And then he went and he, he, he fused it, which is a great thing. Cause that's what you're doing. You're, you're making the next thing. And he, he would do it with, with modern tech techniques with, with Sonics and 808s. And he would, he would turn it into almost a more avant-garde style. You know, he would turn it into this, you know, it's why he's so popular is because the thing he turns out and he's such a perfectionist when it comes to production that when he turns it out, it's something that no one's ever heard before, but he's working on that. Mm -hmm. That's what he always, he's going for. Always. And, and, and that's, what's made him stellar. It's like, yeah, he's got a crazy personality. He's got big personalities all over the place, but you know, uh, what does he say? Name one genius that isn't crazy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. But he, but he, that's his obsession though. His genius is tied to his obsession with that 
perfection of what's next, you know, and, and he works with so many people like, um, the last episode we did, um, was over Travis Scott. Ah, yeah. And, and, you know, same kind of vibe, but he's taking it with the next generation of, of rappers and of music and, and, and he's just so tied in with all these people and he knows so many people and so many people mutually respect him mm -hmm. and, and he's just collaborating, you know, left and right, whether it's, you know, someone that's, a I don't know, you want to call it a mumble rapper mm -hmm. or whatever gospel artist yeah or yeah but it's every it's all over the place and and it was the same dynamics of Kanye's kind of success I, and I mean you know he's not the only one that's done it you know Diddy's done it and and but but Post Malone's doing it yeah, yeah. but but that's a but I really think the nitty gritty of what makes it so satisfying to listeners is that fusion, that, that concept of, of fusion. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and like, I'll, I'll go back to this guy, um, like Gil Scott, ah, been, Mr. Heron, man, phenomenal, you know, poet. And, and I mean, the, 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 like the precursor, you know, in some ways to rap, you know, and him speaking, speaking spoken word over like jazz and, mm. and, and rhythms, but, but, you know, it was just so passionate and his social commentary and, um, relatable and, and, um, genuine, you know, it wasn't some producer telling him what to say. Not, yeah. No labels, no A&R being like, Oh, you got to act this way. So your right. demographic will enjoy you, your presence more. Right. Well, and that's one kind of rarity, especially of his first, his first album, mm -hmm. you know, is he's, he's able to do that. I mean, that, that's awesome. You know, that's because that, that, his first album pieces of a man, it's a phenomenal album. It's a very heavy, very heavy album, but it's, um, because we, we we did an episode over over Marvin Gaye. Okay. And you know, ah, when he, peace. yeah, and when he when he came out with what's going on, you know, that was his first control of the wheel. Right. Yes. And and that was the first thing he wanted to do is talk about what's what he sees, you know. And uh his, his name's on all the writing in, in, in his perception is, his, uh, is, uh, or his, is, um, the way he sees things is, is, is written out. It's, and it's palpable, you know, the way, the way he, he produces it, runs it, even the design of the album itself with his notes and stuff like that. It's him through and through. And, you know, Motown didn't want to do that album, you know, um, it's unsafe. Yeah. Well, he didn't. Yeah. And, um, Barry Gordy, the, the, the main producer of Motown, I mean, he literally told him if this is a flop, if, if the single is a flop, you're never going to do this again. You're going to go by our rules again. Remember? Cause we're the ones that run the show. And then, and then he's like, but if it works, we'll let it, we'll release it. Yeah. And it, and it went so well. And that he made another album, uh, You're the Man. Have you ever listened to that album? I prob I'm sure I have. I just don't know uh, by by name alone. I'd have to like hear it and be like, oh, yeah, I've heard this. Yeah, well, it actually came out last year. Really? It, it, okay, then I haven't heard it at all. You need to check it out. Okay. It's a very um, – so it's crazy. It's kind of a compilation album. Mm -hmm. It's not really a full album he had fleshed out and right. just never released. But the majority of it was. But it was his – part two of what's going on, but Motown didn't want to risk it. They're like, it's great. But, and you're, you're Marvin, you know, you're mm -hmm. going to sell, but we're not going to do it again. Oh, wow. And so Gordy threw it into the vault and it was only released last year. And you have like, I mean, some beautiful pieces of music. And mm -hmm. I mean, some, I, I, I know I've mentioned this before, but, um, like, um, where are we going is like kind of the title track. Well, it's not the title track. The title track is you're the man, but where are we going is literally like what's going on part two. Okay. And, uh, pieces of clay is just such a dynamic song. It's a beautiful song. Um, going home is a beautiful song. You know, just about him embracing his family, seeing his family, but so much of his family centric. It's so relatable. Like, the things that he's talking about, he wrote it, you know, he, again, this is him in his environment. This is him expressing himself. Lucky. And, uh, and so last year when that came out, I, I just thought it was a random little best of, or I don't know. And then I read the little explanation of it. I was like, Oh my God, unreleased like, tracks. What in the world? It's like, why wouldn't you want to release that after what's going on? But at the time, you know, it's, I'm sure they're afraid. They didn't know what was marketable. No, you're looking at 71 and, uh, I don't know, you know, they just decided not to do it and it's calculated and whatever. But that, 
in itself, that, um, that commentary, um, that starts becoming more common and especially like, like he started to open the gates, um, you know, cause in the, the temptation started talking more about societal stuff. Uh, all the Motown people eventually started to kind of evolve in, in that kind of way. Getting in, yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and that kind of commentary. Um, but anyways, but going back to, to Gil Scott, that, it's just so, I don't know, again, I just want to use that word. It's palpable. When you listen to his music, it's just, you feel what he was feeling when he was writing it. You know, it's just so vibrant and lively and, and, and his delivery is just like, it, it's a passion. It, it, it's almost like the, the, the feeling of it is, it, I, I don't know. I equate it to like a, listening to a good leader, listening to a great speech. Oh, you know okay. what I mean? I mean, it's not, cause, it, cause that's like, that's what's different about it is it's not just like a good little poppy tune. It's like he wrote that to get your attention and mm. highlight things, you know, over fantastic music. I mean, like the, the session, the musicians he used were phenomenal. Um, sure. um, I'm forgetting who the drummer was. The drummer on that album, on his first album was phenomenal. Um, Bernard, his last name starts with a P. I need to look it up. Mm. But, um, but anyways, uh, very random. But I've been diving back into that album because I haven't listened to that album in a little bit. And so just trying to listen to all the jazz that I had, um, it was awesome. Um, so anyways, random yeah. little tangent. Oh, man. Um, I feel the same way when I hear really solid hip hop. Mm. Um, it's always been good at discussing the, the views of the world at the time. Mm -hmm. Um you know, uh, from Wu Tang to uh, man, who's who's really Ken, good? Kendrick. Kendrick, yeah, Kendrick's brilliant. Uh, I think J Cole does a especially good job, even more so than Kendrick. I think Kendrick is really good at um, making the entirety of the message very artsy and uh, mm. modern, and putting a good spin on it. Good enough to get get a Pulitzer. So, um, J Cole is really good at kind of uh, giving it to you in a more uh, meat and potatoes type of way, mm. but still, still soulfully creative and his ingenuity behind his production is still top notch, oh, yeah. but just a, just a slightly different flavor than, than Kendrick. I, so I know, um, when miles was kind of coming up or he had already come up, he'd already been sort of big in, in New York and mm -hmm. spreading through the country, but, uh, he would go to operas and go watch mm -hmm. operas and go see, you know, uh, classical was another big art of his that he wouldn't really do, but he would explore. I mean, he did go to Juilliard, uh, for, a what was it? I think, I think it was like a semester. I think he went either went for a semester or a year in a semester. Mm -hmm. And, um, he would, he would go to operas and he would go to classical concerts and he would go see all these weird things that most of these classic jazz artists wouldn't go see. And, mm. you know, Char Charlie Parker had been dead for, for a while at this point already, but you know, you still had Oscar Peterson you still had all these huge sax people, saxophones. And, um, he would, he would kind of do things out of the norm just to, just to get, either a chord in his head or just some kind of writing technique, mm. uh, in his head to make, to make the new thing. Yeah. Um, which is always interesting to, to watch his concerts and he'll, when he's doing a concert for an album that he just made, he, he never, um, he never goes back. He always is playing most of the time, the music of that, that record that he's mm. uh, put out. Right. Um, the interesting part about, listening to somebody who's good, who's, who makes you feel like you're listening to a leader is that it, it's not just with words either. It seems to be with sounds because yeah. that was the thing about miles is that miles always knew, um, when he was improvising, he always knew what to do next or what he felt like people would want next. Mm. And so he would, he would play that randomly. You hear that in, um, like, uh, if you ever listen to Porgy and Bess okay. by, by, by Miles Davis and every, a lot of people already know or have already seen Porgy and Bess, you know, uh, black opera written by, um, Ira and, and um, who is it? Ira and George uh, Gershwin. And a lot of people already know how that sounds, but the way he would, he would kind of touch on the notes, uh, at the time seemed to be 
speaking to the generation of people who were listening to his music at the time and exactly what they either knew, exactly what they wanted or exactly what they wanted that they didn't know. Mm. And it, it seems to be just uh, somebody who's really got their ear to the ground, somebody who's, who's meant for this thing. And that seems to be for such a few echelon of artists, even the famous ones, only a few people get that kind of comprehensive power when mm. it comes to creating. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think, um, just going back to Kendrick really quick, Kendrick, like that's, uh, yeah. that, I think that's what was very attractive. I mean, even since his first album, um, I, I guess it's not technically, I don't think it's technically his first album, section 80. Uh, I think it was a mixtape, but everybody I know, you know, there's like, oh, that's just, that's the first album, really. Yeah. yeah. But it's like, you know, well, actually, I think he samples Gil Scott in his first album. But anyways, but uh, like I'll, I'll focus on like To Pimp a Butterfly. Like that's almost like a jazz album, you know, because mm-hmm. I mean, like the I mean, you know, it bounces back and forth. There's a lot of different genres and it's a big fusion mix. But. I mean, it's incorporating, like, he incorporated a lot of jazz artists for his producers to right. help, you know, like Kamasi and, and, um, was, and, and Robert uh, Glasper was on that, right? I think so. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, I don't know if he really helped in production, but, um, um, George Clinton. Was oh, yeah. Um, but so is Thunder, uh, Thundercat. It's Thundercat, uh, Steve Lacey also. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. kind of more like new, new neo soul jazz yeah. kind of, kind of guy. Yeah. I like Lacey. You know, he, he made that, um, he made his whole first EP on his iPhone. Oh really? Yeah, he made the whole thing on his iPhone. The one with the like the purplish background. Yeah, or whatever. yeah, with uh, tie dye looking. Thing. Exactly. Yeah, he yeah. made it all on his iPhone. Hmm. You know, Kanye said that on his last album, every vocal, a majority of them, is from his iPhone. Are you serious? Yeah, that's that's wild. It's a testament to the technology, man. <laughs> that's <laughs> a that, that's a skill to to mix and master like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's good uh, engineering. I mean, he's kind of messed with it, you know, post, but. Yeah. Still, it's just crazy. That that is one. But um, but yeah, I mean that's because I don't remember where I read this, but because someone at one point referred to Kendrick as almost like if you turn a jazz artist into a rapper, like the way he comes at it, the way his mind thinks Mm -hmm. is almost like a jazz musician, not a traditional rapper. Good. Um, (laughs) Yeah, well, I think it, and that's what makes him very interesting, you know, because there's, it's not, it's not a simple beat with 808s and in the typical, you know, whatever. It's, it's, he loves the, the eclectic, the weird, the weird stuff. And that's why I love that album because it does feel different. Like to Pimp a Butterfly does, majority of it does feel more like a jazz presence, but it's, uh, um, in fact, I read that. Um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting his name. Herbie Hancock. Hancock. Thank you. I don't know why his last name slipped for a second. <laughs> um, I read that he is producing an album with Kendrick, like Snoop Dogg, Thundercat, Ooh, Kamasi. That's gonna be a funky. Yeah, album. and the dude's in his 80s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, killer. Um, Super killer. Uh, still. Man, I I would still to this day love to see Herbie Hancock. Mm, you know, that'd um, be crazy. even comparative. I know it's been a long time since his prime prime, and I say that with quotations. But I think, you know, once it's all up there, uh, especially the the way he plays, he can he can replicate it. it it's just gonna get better, especially mm. with his inclusion of new artists. And he he's also an artist that has um, integrated. Uh, new technology to his act. Oh yeah! Ever since he was young, that's why I mean, Miles loved him. He was he was using tape recorders during during recordings, like before that was a that was a thing, like little small tape recorders mm. to to kind of give another sound or another vibe. Um, you listen to his uh, you listen to the work he did on on Bitches Brew or what he did with with um, with Miles Davis himself or some of the the recordings like I've, I've got one where he's with uh, like Freddie Hubbard and Stanley Stanley Turrentine. Um, I, I can't remember the bass player or the drummer, so I, I f- forgive me. But uh, some of the some of the options, the the sounds that he picks for his his keys are um, at the time out of this world. Nobody's really like picking that kind of sound, mm. and he's he's always been one to to advance his sound with the help of technology. He's yeah. never been afraid of it. Yeah, and it seems like um, a lot of artists that get stuck in one lane are afraid of of integrating uh, the new 
technology into their creations. Yeah. Or just, yeah. Or just alternate technology. Yes. In general. And, but that's, you know. yeah, but that's what, that, that's how you, I can't remember. I think it was McCartney said something like this is like, you know, the new sound is just someone that something that someone's playing on the other side of the world. You just haven't found it yet. Right. And, um, then it's very true. I mean, in a way, like what you said, you know, go to the opera like Miles would do and, and find the little, you know, like, oh, that timing's interesting. Oh, mm-hmm. what's that instrument? You know, and like all those little things. Um, and uh, I mean, not to stay on McCartney, but, you know, like that was an, a very drawing thing, like for me. That man's to, a genius. Yeah, absolutely. But that's why he's always like hunted after is the next sound the next musician like he wants to work with with everybody you know he's worked with kanye he's worked with, i mean there's so many Michael. people yeah i mean oh. but but like even going back to the the beatles days where i mean they still had a lot of control of their sound when they were the beatles sure but like you know turn of the um of their era, you know, mid sixties going from a, a touring band to the typical band, the typical expectation of their career. You're touring all the time and every six to the six months to a year, you're going to release an album. Um, but then when they stop touring, come revolver, come Sergeant pepper, mm-hmm. and then they, they're more in the studio. And now that's when they really get experimental. And like that, that's a big change in music when people, focus on the studio rather than the the performance right. rather than what we're going to do. And we're going to go in there and then a producer and a white lab coat come in and mess with our instruments and make sure they're all right. And it's like, no, no, we're going to run the show. Mm-hmm. We're going to take our time and we'll piece it together how we want it to sound. And that's how you get crazy songs like, um, tomorrow never knows by the Beatles where it's just like, what are these sounds? What is this? Is that a backwards guitar? You know, like <laughs> it's like crazy things. But in, 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 I don't know, you know, but that, that song is literally composed out of random samples that McCartney had recorded. Just recorded. Already. He just had all these random, you know, here's a sitar, here's a car, you know, all these random things. And, and, um, uh, there's a really cool interview with George Martin where he explains like how they did it. And they have all these, these tape machines going, and they have a different tape in each one and they're just playing it and they make the room into like an instrument because oh, wow. they're like, all right, let's run that sound backwards. No, slow it down. Let's pace it out. Okay. And then let's do this one. And that's literally what they're doing. They're balancing it in the studio. They turn the, 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 the room into an instrument. That's some crazy searching right there. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that's, that's how you do it, you know, like, <laughs> and, 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 and cause you just, you, you never feel satisfied. And that's how, that's what, that's what McCartney comes off to me is it's like, yeah, yeah, never here's, here's my new album. Now I'm going to go tour and I'm in my mid seventies and then keep going. You yeah. know, it's just like, that's awesome, man. I'm it's always like, staying up to date in my own lane and pushing it. Yeah. Pushing myself always yeah yeah um man paul mccartney was a genius a genius writer if you ever like go back and and look at his lyrics um some of the you know it, it had the the brilliant part of, about his music is that it had so many different themes hmm. um uh like what's it um uh, Maxwell, uh, Maxwell think, Silverhammer, Max, Maxwell Silverhammer, or Rocky Raccoon. Um, no, he's a master storyteller. Oh, master storyteller but, from from all these different worlds. Um, I would, you know, you would never, not never have guessed it, but uh, you don't really meet that many songwriters who are also the performers of their own music who have such a good handle on writing lyrics. Yeah, uh, kind of like uh, also like Leonard Cohen or. Um, uh, what's it, what's his name? Um, like a rolling stone. Um, Dylan. Yes. Dylan. Okay. <laughs> wow. I was going to say Billy Joel. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. Right. Saved you. Yeah. But yes, thank you. Uh, Bob Dylan, everybody would have been castrating me. I'd have, I'd have been stoned or whatever you do to music, but sacrilegious I, people. <laughs> but I get what you mean. Cause like he, he was a genius. I mean, like one thing I, I like to bring up as an example of, of how, what made him a little bit different than like, I don't know. Cause he, he, he does have a formula. Like he knows what works. He knows how to make the pop song. Sure. But then like what you said, you, you brought Maxwell silver hammer, which is a very random song, bang, but, bang. but I love to compare that song to helter skelter mm. because uh, the white album's my favorite Beatles album. Same. 
Nice. Nice. And uh, did you know that's the most sold? That's the highest selling Beatles album of all time. Really? Yeah. I, I mean, it's that. it's a huge. It's a double LP. So yeah, you know, it makes, it makes sense. sense. But I mean, I love it through and through. Yeah. But um, I like to compare those songs because uh, their 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 writing doesn't really match the tone of the song. Mm-mm. If you swap them out. It makes sense. Right. You know what I mean? Because Helter Skelter, it's like, it's like talking about going on a slide for Mm -hmm. the most part. It's very positive. But it's such a like heavy, heavy, heavy song, man, you know? And, uh, and he only made that song because Pete Townsend from the who told him that he had just come up with the hardest rock song that he had ever heard. And McCartney was like, uh, what? No, no, we're going to do that. We're going to do that. He's like, we're going to meet. Let's meet. I got something. Let's do it. And then they just pumped it out in like, I think like two days. They're just like 20 something takes and they got it in this hard hitting song about going down a slide. And and then you compare it to Maxwell Silver Hammer, which is like this light hearted, like beat bop. And then it's about a murder. Right. It's about a murder. <laughs> and it's like, what? <laughs> but that's the genius. It's like you, cause like if you could sing that and not maybe even realize what's, what's going on in the composition of the song, if you're not paying attention, same thing with the Helter Skelter is like, it's, it's super intense, but like, listen to it. It's, you know, it's like, he hasn't, it's just, I don't know. Nothing's hard, Nothing's hurting you in the song. Really? Yeah. Versus you know what I mean? B- Maxwell's silver hammer. <laughs> you play, if you play a uh, helter skelter for people who don't listen to the Beatles, they'll be like, damn, who's this? They, <laughs> you know, they just hitting this hard. You tell them it's the Beatles. But if you play like Maxwell's silver hammer, they'll be like, Oh, this sounds like some Beatles shit. Blah, yeah. Blah, blah. And it's like, Oh yeah, it is the Beatles. Yeah. So I think people like the Beatles had that, um, almost had that original boy band beach sound that that they kind of had back in the past when they were competing with the beach boys yeah and i think that was organic because of that competition yes. in the in the music world mm-hmm. but again I think it was McCartney because he was the main driving force, especially in the ha- second half of the 60s. Oh, yes. They were everyone else was so dialed out or over each other or learning from someone else like Miles or Derek Clapton or, you know, just n- meeting new people and new influences and realizing like, oh, they're drawn to me now. Now I can make new music. I can mm-hmm. work with this guy maybe. And and it was McCartney. I was like, let's, let's, let's get together. Let's get together. Let's do it. And, uh, and you see it also with wings, you know, that he, it evolves of course, but he always comes back to that, that pop formula that he has for certain songs, but then he'd branch out he would do these random intense things or talk about, you know, like he's very, very clean. He'd try and pe- keep anything that he did that was a little weird, you know, in private. Mm. He talks about that a lot. He's a very private person, but then as he gets in the wings, you get these weird, like, you know, good little pop ditties and then you'd have this song about drugs and you're like, mm. what you know <laughs> like you know it's just like it's just random Here stuff you go, kids <laughs> Here you go. but but that was because i think that he knew he knew how to keep the the people around and he knew how to, to pump it out um kind of like tchaikovsky mm. if you oh, oh sorry uh so like uh like uh the nutcracker suite okay uh swan lake gotcha. 1812 overture like these huge big or uh a better composer to to John Williams. Mm, okay. Okay. So like John Williams has all these soundtracks from right. all these films that everybody has loved. And you can kind of, when you listen to it, you can kind of be like, Oh man, this sounds like some kind of movie. And, uh, before Hans Zimmer came around and became big, it was most likely John Williams putting out these triple A. Uh, yeah. These triple yeah. A, uh, soundtracks or, you know, writing the Olympic theme. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He wrote the Olympic theme. Oh, I don't know. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. Yeah, he's, it, like you said, he just knew what the people would go for mm-hmm. or what they, what, what would r- get a rise out of the emotions of the people when hearing this piece. Wow. Uh, he was very, very in tune with, uh, yeah. with the people and, he just knew it worked. Yeah. 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 Well, that's the funny thing is, is Zimmer feels like the next, like the current, you know, he, he touches everything and it's gold. We're, yeah. We're on a, we're on an eclectic kind of sound when it comes to classical music, you know, very avant-garde, you know, modern, everything's, everything's grayscale colored sounding and, um, yeah, just very, very modern sound. Mm. And Hans Zimmer kind of fits that mold, but doesn't take it too far left to where people don't recognize that it's music anymore. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's not too experimental. No. It's, but it's still got the boom. Yeah, it's got the dark tones. Okay, got this one dark tone. Got a bell off in the distance somewhere. The orchestra swells over 
three, four minutes playing the same thing. Yeah. I'm, thinking, I'm thinking about the um, what's a uh, Inception, Inception soundtrack. soundtrack. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's one of the most intense ones, isn't it? Of all time, <laughs> huge, huge soundtrack. It's like, like if you if you want a soundtrack that kind of explains anxiety, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, anxiety incarnate in sound. Yes, that's exactly it. But yeah. Um, um, that's crazy. Yeah. Hopefully, I hope he's a nice guy. It sounds like all these uh, big time artists. I don't know about composers, but big time artists are like always have this really weird behavior towards other people. Um, going back to Miles, like, you know, Miles was um, was a pimp. Was he? Yeah, he was a pimp. That, that, you know, he had, he had many prostitutes. He was a womanizer, woman beater, um, would turn away from the crowd when, when he would play or like during concerts, mm. he would walk off the stage during concerts. He would, uh, you know, just said some of the rudest things to people in, in rebuttal, you know, uh, there's a, another famous trumpet player named Lee Morgan. Okay. And he's talking to his wife, um, and he, you know, I don't think he knew who the wife was, and he, but he was like, oh, what's your name? And she said this and, and he's like, oh, you're Lee's wife. And she's like, yeah. And he's like, well, you know who I am, blah, blah, blah. And she said something and he's like, there's nothing more I hate than a smart mouth bitch. <laughs> right. That was his personality. And, you know, same James Brown, woman mm. beater, womanizer, drug abuser, uh, you know, just go on to some of these talk shows high as hell. I know you've seen that one oh, that, yeah. that Key and Peele replicated with the one where he has the glasses on. Yeah. Living in America. <laughs> you know, like, oh, just my singing. God. Yeah. Oh, man, that's so funny. What's up with you, dude? Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I wish I could remember some of the questions she asked because oh. she, she tries to keep that interview going. And then she just kind of, what? <laughs> Feeling great. <Yeah. laughs> just like out of it. <laughs> but, oh, man. Oh, that's amazing. But yeah, it just seems like uh, some of these geniuses in music, um, because their because their work gets so much praise, they just have this um, very I wouldn't say violent streak, but um, out of the norm, not okay, kind of, kind of attitude towards things. Inflated you, egos. Inflated egos. That you know, they feel like they're untouchable. Yeah. And for a large part of the time, society treats them untouchable. Mm. Who's who's that uh, one dude? Who's the dude who shot the toe? Who shot uh, Meg the Stallion's toe? Um, uh, what's his name? Lacey? No. Um, do you know who I'm talking about? Okay. Uh, well, he, he was the one who was, who was making all the versus battles between the, the big famous artists during the, the bulk of the quarantine. Oh. He was responsible for putting those together. Okay. And so, you know, he was already getting famous and then reached a whole new level of fame because he was in control of this. Mm. And so, you know, one day, you know, starts hanging out with Meg the Stallion on a regular and then. I don't know what happened, but it ended up with her, with him shooting her toe off. Tory Lanez. Tory Lanez. Oh. That's who it is. Uh, Tory Lanez. I, I see that the same way. Tory Lanez, Chris, uh, Chris Brown. Um, Con uh, Con yeah, of course. Con oh, man. <laughs> Kanye. Kanye just hasn't publicly beaten anybody. Um, so he's, <laughs> yeah, it seems yeah, like he's done everything for. but, you know, being a womanizer mm. per se or a woman beater. But all the other strange off streaks. You know, now they feel like a god. They feel like I, I exude, you know, the thing. I exude the cool. I exude what, what's current. Like right. I'm me. Yeah. It's like you, if you like me, then it doesn't matter what I do, right? Exactly. Or like what a I can't remember who said it. It's like if I'm the champion, then what I do is champion behavior. I don't have to act like a champion because I'm already in one. Wow. Why would I change that? Mm. <laughs> he even has a song called Champion. <laughs> Ain't that crazy? But you know, but you know, it's got to turn into that that, that dyna internal dynamic at some point. And we're like, I want to be the best. Mm. And once you are the best, we're like, well, I am the best. So what I do is what the best would do. Right. So why would I question what I want to do immediately? And you have a whole following of people who are going to follow you, whatever you say. You yeah. Know, listening to all Especially the Especially nowadays, that's even more, not, just, not apparent, but more... I don't know, sensitive 
that like you 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 have a constant public presence. You know, mm-hmm. if you want to, you can you can stream everything you're doing. You ever do? You could you could update anybody on what you're doing. But, you know, but we throw it back to there. We were just talking about sixties, fifties, seventies. You needed a platform to do that. Right. You needed someone to clear what you were going to say before you said it. Uh huh. You know, you needed someone that was going. Like I said, in the white coats and the la and the producers are going. No, nah, let's let's not do that. We're like, going to ask you these questions, and you know, they give yeah. you that prompt ahead. What of should time. we stay away from? Mm, like, yeah, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, no, no, no. And that's like the thing. Like this freeform conversation. Pod- I think this is why this resonates with people. Podcasts, conversational mm-hmm. podcasts, really resonate with people is because it's totally organic, totally genuine. You know, it's authentic, and there's no cuts. There's no nothing. It's just let's talk, and nothing's really planned. It's just you know, because that's a beautiful thing about communication. It's about the uh, the work to understand each other. Mm-hmm. You know, right. And the challenge of that and appreciating that. Exactly. And, um, but anyways, getting back to everyone having a microphone in their hands nowadays, anybody can do that. But that's why I mean that like, we, I mean, we have these computers in our pockets at all times. Mm-hmm. You could you could know as soon as Kanye bought an order of fries if you wanted to let you know. You could know it and you could be like, oh, man, I want fries. Yeah, right. Kanye got fries. Kanye, what kind of fries did Kanye get? Oh, he puts pepper on his. Where you know, did like, he get them from? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just like all these little knit, you know, little things. Yeah. You're like, oh, wow, that makes him him. You yeah. know, I want that. You know, but that's a that's a crazy thing about nowadays, and and especially like our generation and the, and the next generation. That's because we didn't exactly grow up with it, but it, social media and stuff like that was integrated by when we were in high school. Well, we're pioneers, big time. Yeah, yeah. Well, but I feel like we are a very fortunate <clears throat> generation because we grew up on a majority of analog. Yes, stuff. a lot of analog stuff, and then we saw it transition, you know, slowly. And then by the time we were adults, we were kind of like testing the waters of this kind of stuff, or you know, on the cusp of that. And now it's just kind of like, you know, like I talk to the younger, younger people and, and they're just not accustomed to that, not getting an answer. They don't know. If, they don't know what a floppy disk is. Oh, yeah. A cassette, VHS. Yeah. What's a VCR? What's a VCR? <laughs> but, you know, what you, have to, you, you have to you have to rewind it. Yeah. Rewind, oh, it. my God. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, you, you, you rewind it, you know, because no wonder Blockbuster went out of business. <laughs> but the. uh but that, you know, but I think, like, I appreciate that. Like, I appreciate that trajectory or that, you know, that lineage of, of, of watching that evolve and understanding, like, you can be susceptible to influence from these people if you're constantly in, 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 in introducing them into your life. You know, if you're constantly obsessed with how people perceive you on social media. You'll become obsessed with that and you'll morph into this public perception while you're maybe struggling with a lot of things personally, you know, it's just like, it's a weird thing. And then when you try and compare your, your life to like someone's best of their highlights on their social media. Mm-hmm. And then we're, now I'm talking about friends and stuff right now, but then if you take it up a notch and you're comparing it to one of these people, these big personalities, you know, that's where things can be talk, you know, toxic, get a little weird. Right. Cause then you become a uh, fan obsessed. You become your, your character is intertwined with this person you don't really know. Right. And, but you know so much about them mm-hmm. and you're constantly seeing what they're doing on a day-to-day basis that sometimes that's a weird influence, you know, an impression. Ooh. And, um, um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I just, I like to bring that up because it's just such a weird thing to think about, like in context compared to this, this other times that we're talking about that these artists didn't have to deal with that. No. Well, but, they, they deal with other things, you know, they deal with, uh, knowing that they're the influencers, like who, who do they turn to for their influence? And it, it seems like a lot of these the bigger you are, the more likely you are to be, uh, segregated because of, because your fandom or your fan following, Mm -hmm. like there, it doesn't seem like there are a a whole bunch of big time artists with a lot of, uh, loved ones or friends around them. You know, I think about Prince or Michael Jackson, who both, you know, Robin Williams, they all, you know, two of them, two of them, uh, what Prince overdosed. And so did, so did Michael, Mm -hmm. uh, Robin Williams obviously killed himself, uh, but they they were all by themselves. You know, they were all alone. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like they died on a deathbed, were surrounded by family members. They they were just doing what they were doing, but by themselves. And these are some of the biggest uh, people in in any kind of art ever to just be so isolated because 
because of their their influence. Their influence makes them feel like gods or revered. And then at the higher you get up to knowing these people, the more the more likely you are to see people trying to take advantage of them or trying to, you know, um, trying to use their relationship with each other as some kind of uh, backdoor to a better opportunity that they're not really prepared for. And it just feels as if while we're suffering from trying to keep up with these Joneses, they're suffering because there's, you know, all these people are trying to trying to compete with them all the time. All these people are trying to prove to them why I deserve this spot or this stardom or everybody looking at me and you don't. And that, you know, I just uh, I think extreme fandom like that seems to have this like huge circle of of issues when it comes to people's uh, developing their own their own way in life, the way they do things, you know, because they model it after these these celebrities and stars and these other celebrities and stars are just like, yo, man, I'm just trying to live a good life and go shopping and paparazzi is always around me and everybody's always talking about what I'm doing. But the record labels want people to talk about what I'm doing. But sometimes I don't feel like talking about what I'm doing, but I have to anyways. and I don't feel like talking to this person and this person won't talk to me because of this deal or who I work with and yada, yada, yada. And it's all, it's all like this big mess. Yeah. Messy dynamics. Mm -hmm. Especially with everybody getting a supercomputer in their pocket. Right. And, and then now that that starts to, and along with streaming, it starts to sway what labels are looking for. Mm -hmm. You know, like, have you seen the, the Joe Rogan episode with the black keys on? No, that's a really. But good I do one. enjoy the Black Keys. That's a really good one. I mean, Patrick Carney, the drummer, talks the majority of the time, but I love his personality, and he goes he goes really in on that, like mm. his complaints with the industry currently, and and he talks about that. Um, I mean, a few people have, but like this is a very current thing is that labels are looking for people that already have a following, you know, we're yeah. looking for people that already have a big social media presence with thousands and thousands or a million, you know, they're looking for TikTok to, to convert these, you know, minor people into stars. They're not necessarily being super nitpicky about their talent. longevity or talent <laughs> huh. or, or complexity mm-hmm. or, or relations and, and all these things. It, it, it's just like, it, let's make it easy for us. You right. Know? And, um, it's already done. The work is already done. Yeah. yeah. And then let's get them on Spotify and pay them a few cents every song. And, and it's, it's a weird, it's so weird. Um, cause yeah, it, cause, cause he even vents about that really hardcore. And I mean, I get it that you're not, you're not getting, you might not get the best of the best. And that's why I don't know. And, and with streaming, platforms like Spotify and Apple and stuff like that, curated playlists and stuff like oh that and God. algorithms that actually pay attention to your, your, your niches, where you like to go and what kind of songs you gravitate to. And the, like the, you know, what is like the genius algorithms where it's like, this is a heavy song with mm. light tones. Oh man, it's, tone. it sucks picking your own genre, especially when you're using these online uh, distribution websites. Like, uh, so I, I have a band out here in Ar- in Arlington called Artemis Funk. Okay. So we, you know, we came out with a project um, and then came out with another single that came along with a project afterwards. But I remember the process of, of kind of uploading it to DistroKid and doing all these things, filling all these things out, trying to pick a sound of where we go, where, where would go um, and just kind of seeing how it worked. And uh, for all all things considered, you know, the experience, the first experience of something like this was OK. But then um the way that they pick those genius curated playlists is um is so it's like they pick uh they i hate to say it but they always try to pick something very modern sounding so there's this uh, other band in the area called famous exchange so they they had a song they had a single uh called emotion uh basically E uh, and M with ocean at the end. Oh, okay. Um, and I, I remember watching that song when it first hit hearing it and then just, you know, falling in love. It was a great song. I knew the, uh, we knew the people personally. And then, you know, kind of coming back to their Spotify and they have over 200,000 monthly listeners. Oh, wow. Yeah. Their, their, their song is doing absolutely bonkers, crazy. You know, it's probably put on a few playlists and you, you think about it and you're like, man, like, of course, yeah, you, you would listen to that song, but you're also like, man, how do they, but how do they pick 
anyways are they just trying to look for something modern sounding and how do you pick your genre how do you how do you find the audience that is supposed to listening mm. listen to your music um do i hire somebody to tell me what what my song is like or what my song sounds like mm. what genre it is you know because now it feels like i'm splitting hairs right you know what i mean yeah well especially like and like we're saying if you like to fuse things if you like to cross things and you don't know even what subgenre if you know it's generally jazz what subgenre you want to put it in what do you want to be picky about it, it does get hard because i mean like with our group like we change constantly like what i don't know what we you Can know, you tell me the name are. of your group again uh, the mind canary uh, mind canaries okay um because we're all we all have different ears you know right and you know like the our bassist like he's primarily like and he likes heavy metal and rock stuff for the, that's where his ear goes to mm-hmm. for the most part um our drummer well i'm the drummer and a guitarist but our other guy marshall we kind of change swap out if one of us is playing one i'll play the other you okay. know um the marshall and evan um evan's the rhythm guitarist and lead guitarist uh the uh they're brothers okay they were both in percussion, but, you know, Marshall likes, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of just what I've seen from what he plays around is like, it's like more, he likes funky stuff, but he just likes weird stuff, you mm. know, like crazy time signatures and, oh, okay. and you know, he's just kind of, he, he likes that eclectic stuff. Kind of like math rock. Uh, kind of, but I mean, he's all over the place, Okay, you know, I mean, he's listening to all sorts of genres, but they're, it's not like the, 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 the popular stuff from those genres, you know, it's like deep stuff. And he likes to listen to find local people and, and really get into them mm. for the most part. Um, and then his brother, Evan, um, you know, he, he likes reggae and, and funk and, 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 and rock and stuff, but it's like, he, he will get in these little grooves where all of a sudden we're playing kind of like a reggae song or we're playing like a heavier song. Now mm-hmm. we're playing this like slow blues song. And it's like, it's just all over the place because, and in me, I'm like blues, psych rock. I don't know. You know, it's just, well, I love like everything, but like the playing style the stuff I've learned for the most part, it's in that, it's in that blues rip, uh, lane and so when we all play and then we all introduce like what we've come up with and we all try and riff on that or add on to it yeah it gets harder and harder to figure out like what, what would we call this yeah you know if it was just you i would call it this yeah if it was you me and him i would call it this but all together i don't know that's when you new alternative yeah, yeah. <laughs> new that's, alternative rock yeah and when, yeah that's why whenever anyone ever asks me what's it what's your style I'm like it's alternative uh, yeah alternative rock <laughs> Psych blues, nice blue, nice something. blanket statement. Yeah, and it's like oh, okay. It's kind of how uh, R and B was because if you listen to old R and B before you get to like nineties, mm. you know, it, was, it man, it it sounds nothing like nineties R and B. Sounds nothing like today's R and B. Nineties R and B kind of has this like very defining sound, um, and so when you say R and B, it's very easy to include that. But R and B before that, when it was given to the instrumentalists to come up with R and B, you know, it was really rhythm and blues. Mm. It wasn't this soulful, sexy, you know, uh, soul quarians kind of thing. It was no Erica Badu. It was you know Stanley Turrentine doing playing hallelujah or or some shit like that um so yeah those those blanket statements are those blanket genres are really i guess they're there to to explain the unexplainable at the moment Mm -hmm. until it becomes a defining carved out genre and most most of those sounds that we can't explain don't even come out to be that explained you know yeah yeah well i mean like let's like like helter skelter Mm -hmm. you look at that and some people would call that more like a punk heavy rock song Mm -hmm. you know but like you said before and you're like that's the beatles yeah it's like the beatles it is and it was it was uh, the beginnings you know of that of 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 the gritty grainy you know overdrive type of stuff and um you know and you move into people like uh, neil young's career where you know they call him the grandfather of grunge because that's what he was doing in the late 60s already was just blowing out his his guitars making it sound so heavy to a pretty simple beat but then he would just you know come in on something real gnarly and then that but it was just rock right and then someone found that and was like oh i like that i want that to be everything (laughs) i want that to be everything that i am and that'll be my sound that'll be my north star you know and then you carve out the the path of well 
I, I stick to those type of distortions or effects or whatever. And that makes me hard rock. That makes me thrasher or, or, or punk, you know, you get those, but you got to carve them out. You got to figure out what it is. What it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's always the hard part. That's yeah. What, I like Zeppelin. Um, mm. big fan of Zeppelin for, for that sound. Anyways, uh, what was I going to ask you? I was going to ask you, um, have you, so have you, you've played shows, right? Uh, no, you yeah. haven't played a show. No, we were going to try to this year and then obviously, okay. Are you going to try to start in Arlington? Uh, Are you trying to go to Dallas or Fort Worth? Well, actually, um, yeah, a buddy of ours has, uh, he knows the deep L Mark co okay, nice. owner or manager or whatever. Those are good people. Yeah. And then, um, uh, their cousin owns like a brewery that has like kind of like a show night thing or whatever. We're going to like do that. Okay. And, but yeah, it was very casual. Um, Cause if anything, really my, my, cause I'm really the, I don't want to say I'm like the orchestrator of where we're going or what we're doing, Okay. but like, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I'm the recording person, I'm the engineering person and all that kind of stuff. And my kind of con- loose concept was I'm going to sit cause of COVID and things timing and weird, whatever kind of took the floor out from under me from trying to think that way. I'm going to focus on the podcast, get momentum that way. Mm. Cause like the intro to our podcast is us. Okay. The outro is us. Okay. Um, I want to use more of our music and just in my general content. And then if you look at our website, there's a tab for the mind canaries and it has all those demos. Um, and so I wanted to use the podcast as the platform as the momentum to get an audience, showcase our music Uh and then kind of have a running start instead of having to do that, the maybe a traditional path. Um, let's handle it that way because we're not, you know, two of us are dads. Okay. Um, so schedules are, you know, whatever. Right. yeah. Oof. And so me coming up with this idea, cause I explained it to them that way. Like, cause we talked about it. We talked about gigging and, and starting and doing stuff like that. But two of us, I mean, we're very, we have careers, you know, and stuff like that. And so, you know, me, this is my transition. This is me working on this side project okay. and getting this going. But it, it, when I kind of explain that uh, concept, you know, what if I put it in a lot of work in the podcast, get momentum that way, get an audience that way, and then start saying like, you know, Hey, if you like the show, here's our group, check us out and just slowly work on it that way. Um, cause of scheduling and just like, I don't know, I don't want to like push them out. You know, I don't want to do make too many changes or anything mm. like that, you know? So I, I just kind of, that's the pacing I'm kind of set at, right. I guess is what I'm getting at. Do you, um, do you find that music by itself doesn't really draw people in as much as it used to? Ooh, what do you mean? Well, for instance, you know, you were just saying like, uh, you know, you were going to use the podcast to gather, uh, the crowd, right. Mm-hmm. And kind of, take that and, and roll with it. Right. I feel like people, a lot of people nowadays you do that, but with social media. So they're like, Oh, I'm going to be yeah. a TikTok or a, a vine or an Instagram or a Snapchat celebrity. And then I'm going to come out with a diss track or I'm going to go on to, to Dr. Phil and my, my appearance on Dr. Phil makes me so big that now I feel like I can rap and okay. I know people will buy it. So then I can continue dollar, rapping. Yeah. And a million, I, I, who is that? Uh, what's her name? Uh, 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 bad, bad baby, bad baby. No, that's not bad. That's, is that bad baby? Yeah. Okay. I, I would watch her interviews and just kind of listen to her talk. And obviously, you know, I'm not getting some kind of Einstein level, um, rhetoric from her when she's talking, but I am getting a good, a good semblance of, uh, what it takes to, to be that pop level big. And it's all about courting attention. Mm -hmm. And then once you court the attention, like, uh, kind of giving it some kinetic energy and making sure that it moves somewhere. So now, now that she has like this huge, uh, beginning of a storyline like start crafting the storyline as it goes and Mm. you know people are starting to get into the story and start having jargon and get into this person yeah i get you now it becomes um now this person themselves become a hobby for so many other people well i get you i don't like that i'm gonna compare myself to her oh you're bad yeah you're bad baby (laughs) but but it's kind of the same thought i mean but purposely yeah obviously she had no idea no no, (laughs) not a single thought about it neither the doctor film it's so funny have you ever seen that joe rogan joe rogan yeah, podcast he's like, yeah. i had no idea I, yeah. he's like, she oh said, my god she said that and just flew over me uh, and it was everywhere yeah it was everywhere but anyways but no, 
Oh. Like a monster. <laughs> but uh, he tried. Yeah. He tried not to. Yeah, he, he did. <laughs> None of, nobody else has gotten big from that show. Yeah. But yeah. her. Yeah. She's the only one. <laughs> out of all the hundreds of people that he's helped mm. try to help. But. But basically, yeah, same kind of thing. Because I, I like the way you put it. There's a story to it. You know, you you you, you bring in the audience, and and you're demonstrating who you are on another level. And you know, it's not just. It's not the old track. It's not the old path. It's not the. Here's my album. Here's my single. Let me know what you think. I'm kind of taking the more personal, authentic, the most authentic approach while still being on a you know bigger platform or on social media. Mm -hmm. That's why I like this form of conversation. This form of show is in this show, you know, especially once I'm a few freaking episodes in, so you get a kind of an idea of like my preferences, who I am and stuff like that. And the more I work on it and the more time I I'm able to work on it and, and demonstrate, you know, my passions, what I'm thinking, whatever, then it is a better idea of who I am and what, what I appreciate because I think I said on the last episode, but this, the whole concept of this show is just literally getting the passion out of people, mm. not having good, genuine conversation, authentic conversation and, and genuine music consumption, you know, like just let's review an album. Let's talk about what it, Ooh. what it meant and what, what, what it, what, you know, just because that's what, I think that's going to be the next episode is I'm going to uh, meet with a, a friend of mine and we're going to break down the white album. Oh we're man. Go this, track by track. It's going to be so fun. Yeah. And, but th th that's like awesome. Like, cause like, I love that stuff, right. you know? And, um, I'm thinking about that stuff anyway. So I'm listening to it. It's like, Ooh, what was that? Or listen to the remastered version. Mm -hmm. realize like, Oh, I never noticed what that was. How before. many studio, how many different studios they went in for oh, different songs, yeah. you know, like that's something that people don't do anymore. That like mm -hmm. old albums, you can go back and review and, yeah. and like so, pet sounds. And exact stuff like man. That. Pet yeah. sounds. Oh my God goodness yeah he went to like five different studios for all very specific little niche things mm -hmm. of like well i prefer how the horns sound in this here, you know, oh, here. how he records it yeah or max, masters yeah. it but um how did we get here man uh we were talking about uh oh we were talking about social media oh, and then we started yeah. talking about gathering a crowd during through yeah, different yeah, mediums yeah. and how how music has kind of lost its um uh its audience grabbing effect on its own mm -hmm. you know and, I, and I, you know there's a lot more yeah <laughs> there's a lot more and there's more channels yes there's more outlets mm -hmm. and uh there's there's different curators nowadays there was more again there's just more of everything more of everything and 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 that's why you have to do something a little bit different to stand out you know you're either gonna have a different kind of art or a different kind of style something to present that's gonna shake up minds you're gonna make people you know stand on their you know be on their toes because they're not like what what was that hold on play that again like six nine <laughs> Just, I mean, I mean, I mean, I haven't really listened to I him, mean, so I'm just asking. He, he, I am serious, he, 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 but you know, he did it. He, his, his music was, uh, uh, what do you call it? Very hype, but it wasn't just the music. Cause I watched, I watched the documentary. Oh um, yeah. I haven't seen that. Um, his music wasn't just hype. It was also who he was surrounding himself with. Like mm. some of the things he would go for, like he, uh, the cinematography of his music videos with such, such a low budget. He, this 16 was written renting out uh lambos and driving them through the city for his music video you oh, know wow. you know getting getting like uh him hanging out of the car and another another person like getting that on on you know on an iphone or something like that uh to him i what was it uh i can't even remember the name of the song but he's recording it with a whole bunch of bloods mm -hmm. in, in the hood you know uh to to the clothing that he would make where it would just be like the most obscene things uh not images but words uh that he would print on these clothes and mm. making his own clothes and mm. causing a scene and then all the way to his his rainbow hair you know ev everything everything had this whole um look at me look at me look at me like mm -hmm. as loud as possible with all the channels out there uh he was able to find something that set him apart from everybody else who's trying to get people to look at him mm -hmm. and he made something to get people to look at him and then once he got famous you know he started doing things like calling other artists out shit talking just being a straight troll all the way through him uh <laughs> 
to to him going to to prison <laughs> and then coming out and it just being this big event um, mm. at the beginning of the quarantine too because that's that's when he got out of prison. Yeah. Um, and so he's a he's a master at curating uh, people's attention and and curating like the storyline of of how, what he's going to deliver to people as mm. well. And uh, that seems to be a skill that most record labels used to do for you. You know, they used to have A&R development teams to develop how you were going to be as an artist. Yeah. Now, so, you know, it's up to individuals by themselves to understand what they're going to present to the audience so that a label will be like, Ooh, yeah. you're interesting. Yeah. I'll pick you up. Yeah. Yeah. Like someone like, um, I'm trying to think of modern, like Tyler, Oh like, man. you know, it's like the longer his career goes on, the more, he he finds like himself he finds like the next like version of, of, of how to make it complex and mm-hmm. how to be more i don't know how to present more of a story of himself or how he feels about things it's not just an expected story or a a story that's just gonna it has shock value you know because right. that was a lot of his early career where there's a lot of shock value to his, his early stuff and uh who's that grunge rap mm, yeah it's a heavy shit yeah and um but then with the last two, especially Flower Boy, like, oh, I'd love that album. That yeah. was, that, I, that was, I, I, that was that 2017. I think I, that was like my album of the year that yeah. year. Um, just the production value is just, oh, it's mind blowing in that album. And um, it's just, and it's all him. It's a majority of it's him and, and the people he's collaborating with, it's the people he's, he knows it's mm-hmm. the people he's kept around or the people that have been attracted to him and he respects them and he's helped them in turn, you mm-hmm. know, he's on their stuff, he's helping them. And, um, I don't know, some of the most interesting people right now are the people that, you know, like Chance the Rapper or, um, Frank Ocean, um, just people that it's, it's them. They're working on it themselves. It's mm-hmm. like, it's their brand, you know, Frank Ocean's designing his merch, you know, it's like these things. It's like that. It, it's like, it, it feels more and more real because it's like, I don't have to go through all these people. No. There's not a formula involved. Right. It's like, I thought this was cool. So I put it together, you know, and I presented it to y'all, to the public. Do and you, be, do you be, oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. No. Do you believe that this is the, like the end of labels that we're reaching that kind of like where labels are no longer going to be as necessary as they used to be? I mean, they already have hit that point, but you know, uh, basically, where people aren't striving to be signed for a label anymore. Yeah. I think if anything, I think that still exists for sure. But I think the, the expectation of having to lean on someone like that to, to figure out what your art is and how to capture it Mm. has really eroded. Thanks to, um, I'll, I'll take the technology route first. Um, the basics, the most common stuff, guitar center <laughs> you go in there you're gonna learn how to play you're gonna you can talk to the manager and he's a big nerd he'll nerd out with you and tell you oh i i know what you're going for you try that pedal out try you get you you're getting advice from someone that's really now that's existed before but now they're everywhere right they're everywhere mm-hmm. you can go online look at the reviews of being like hey if you're if you're trying to pull off this kind of sound they say it's going to do that. it's not going to do that you know you can you can do more research than just being like oh you know, the salesperson told me this is what I want. I'm going to buy it and then hope it works out. Um, school yeah, has undercut that. Like go into, I mean, like me, I learned how to mix and master audio in high school. Mm-hmm. I did it for three years. Right. By the time I left high school, I already knew how to make a movie. I already knew how to make a, a track. Yeah. Like, you could go work for somebody's studio. Yeah. Right, but, right out of high school. Right. But I, it's like, but I'd have to demonstrate it. I'd have to flesh it out, work it out, give them a good demo, but I didn't have to lean on someone to really do that Mm -hmm. because now the technology has gotten cheaper, you know, year by year, mics get cheaper, videos, cameras get cheaper. Um, I was just freaking out the other day. Uh, I know it was like a black Friday special or whatever, but an SD card, a memory card for a camera, it was like a hundred and something gigabytes yeah. whatever it was like eight bucks uh-huh oh see yeah those those uh 128 gigabyte ones yeah yeah that's but crazy I remember when like when i was even when we were in high school i remember looking at those for my camera at mm-hmm. the time and it was like i mean i don't think it was like 100 bucks but it was like 80 70 you know it was, it was or 60 you know but it was like 
10 times you know, the price. And it right. was just like, Oh, that's so crazy. Yeah. And if I remember having that, that limitation in my head as a younger person, as an artist of thinking like, man, I, I need it, but it's just like, it's such an expense. Mm -hmm. So I'll have to lean on someone that already has it, like the school oh, or okay. a producer or something like that, you know? And I did have to go that route to get that stuff. But then nowadays, um, it's just, and especially with Amazon, I mean, like you could, if you know what you're looking for, you know, you can find the, the related items, you can learn more. You can, like I said, if, if you're just a really good studious person of just like, just really doing your research on how to develop it, you can figure it out. And then YouTube having brought that up. Yeah. Of, of oh total my Total free God. education. Yes. Um, University like, in a, in a fucking website. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 if, as long as you can find a good, genuine, um, teacher, someone that knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And, 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 um, I mean, you can learn anything. I mean, jumping back into, um, mixing audio this year. Um, I, uh, I, I was, um, they taught us on pro tools okay. in, in wow. high school. Okay. But, um, I'm using audition right now cause I, I have the, um, like the suite, the cloud suite or whatever. So mm -hmm. it's just, it's easy. Um, so I had to learn it. I had to kind of and re, re, re you know, refresh like mm -hmm. what, where, what I need to do and methods and certain things. But, but then I, I just, it's just amazing because as long as I can communicate what I need out of something, I can find it most of the time. Right. You know, as long as you're Jamie, as long as you're an expert Googler, you can find almost anything. You, know, you, you can find how to replace the, this really specific filter on your 2001 Honda XL or LX, whatever, you know, and, and it's like, you don't have to go and uh, go to a mechanic. a mechanic, just like, look, it's right there. Just swap it out. You know, it's easy. F click and subscribe. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> click and subscribe. But, but th that, I, that's, I mean, that's a huge, huge difference maker. And I, and that's why I think it's eroded that kind of perception of like, I don't need to lean on so many, um, 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 institutions or whatever to tell me what my art's going to turn out to be. I can learn to be myself as an artist, as long as I'm like self-disciplined, as long as I, I can stay focused mm -hmm. and can do the right stuff. Um, now I'm not saying everybody's doing that, but I can see how our generation and the next generation that's going to be but just i just see that being the more the more mindset more and more the mindset of being a finding the solution yourself right you know yeah, it and, definitely is the, the culture of kind of asking for the the solutions yourself not asking even down to uh trying to get somewhere and just uh Oh, meet me at this restaurant and you don't ask for the the address anymore. You just look up the restaurant. Yeah. You know, find it yourself. Um, yeah. It's little small car problems or uh, how to how to get the best mix or uh, get the get the industry standard mix uh, for your music. What's that sound like? And what do you have to do for this program? Um, yeah. Just a wealth of knowledge on how to do things. And yeah, the necessity of leaning on established institutions uh kind of fades away and yeah. it has faded away now and we have different institutions like youtube and spotify yeah. soundcloud different metrics mm -hmm. different metrics and built in speaking of metrics built in with things that measure the metrics of who is participating in your product yeah who's drawn to it yeah, exactly yeah and 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 especially me like um someone that like you know, I, I studied marketing and, and, and music development and production or whatever, and realizing that, that, that strength that, that, yeah, I get why the labels are drawn to those people that already have a major following. Cause it, 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 like you said, it makes it easier, but it's also, it's almost like, um, especially if they already have a big following and they've always been self-produced, they're working on their stuff. Like that's just so, that's, that's so much energy behind that. Like so much, um, commitment, discipline, and passion to be like, I, uh, yeah, no, I, I never went to school. I didn't do this. I didn't go through this person, learn it on my own, learn it through YouTube. And, uh, I've, i composed this whole thing and I put it on SoundCloud and, you know, it's gotten, it's gotten a lot of exposure and, and I've got more followers, but it's like, I get why that's so alluring is because it's like, if you gotta be careful anyways, but I mean, that person's putting in work on right. themselves mm -hmm. and, and, and you can't train that. No, you know, you can't, you can't always instill that in a person. They just always have to, you know, want to work, challenge themselves. Right. And, and nowadays with so much information available, so much technology at a cheaper 
cost for the most part. Um, I just see that happening more and more as time goes on, people being more self-reliant, you know, um, uh, I know you just threw out an example, but I love saying this, like, you know, remember back in the day when you would, you would try and think of a fact or you try and think of like, you know, like, Oh, who directed that movie? And if someone in the room didn't know, you're like, Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you just go home. Okay. I can't remember who directed close encounter, but Ooh. whatever, you know, it's whatever. And then nowadays it's just, you don't even ask it. Cause as soon as you ask it to yourself internally, and you're like, yeah, I did do that. Yeah. You know, look at him. Like, oh, yeah, Spielberg. Duh. Yeah, Spielberg. And I'll then, never have to go ignorant again. Yeah, yeah. You never have to unless you choose to. Right. <laughs> unless you choose to. Thank but, God for technology and Google. Yeah. But then you have your your people because I I mean I I like this to to do things this way too the purely authentic they like yeah i i could call you but like i want to see you. i want to interact with you sure um you know um i do want to you know perform i do want to do the that path of you know getting a gig showing showcasing what we can do mm -hmm. showing it to someone else you know out, people like reaching it. out, people liking it, growing and, and, and getting more schedules, you know, getting stuff more on the books. And, um, I know that's always going to exist, right. that, that authentic drive for that. But I just feel like in the world we live in right now, the already kind of microwave world we live in where people want an easy solution or a quick solution. Um, I just, I just see that happening in almost any industry of people being able to adapt to learn and you know, progress at a, at a different level, as long as they choose to push themselves um, and to be careful. I mean, always critical and, and, and trying to always being critical at how you're trying to be clever, you know, of being like, I want to learn this. Um, but am I Googling the right things? Am I getting frustrated by not understanding it the first time and not being able to appreciate it through this medium of just this guy on a flat screen explaining how to play this note and switch to this scale and do all these things? It's like, is that, is that f frustrating, you know, and I just stop because some people do. Yeah. It gets to that point. But then there's other people where, you know, like like me, it's like, I've, I had frustrations and relearning that software, but it's just like, no, no, no. I know what I want to do. And I just need to search better. I need right. to do something. And if I can't do that, I need to find someone that's used the software and ask them. I, I can't just sit here. I can't just boohoo. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Definitely can't boohoo. Yeah. And, and, and I, I don't know if that's just a select few, but I mean, especially for me, man, I just, the abundance of knowledge and technology and, and communication possibilities nowadays, it's, it's daunting, but at the same time, it's so encouraging mm -hmm. because it's like, if I can, yeah, it's a sea of people, it's a sea of content, a sea of art. But if I can find the groove, if I, if I am who I am and can, and showcase it and get it to the right people, then they'll start loving me for who I am. Right. And I don't have to worry about that as much as the momentum builds. I can be me more. Yeah. It's a pure package of me because I've, I've done the groundwork since day one. Right. And, uh, you know, the, definitely I don't have to worry about a label putting out an image of me or an institution putting out an image of me that is not purely 100 percent authentic me, which seems to be something that this generation of people enjoy the most. I read this book called um, uh, I think it's called The Kardashian Effect. And the right, and, um, the writer of the book was discussing how Kim Kardashian um, and the Kardashians themselves, how effective and powerful they are, because their life is a is an open book. Mm. Everything is on camera. Their whole life, the, all their secrets and the drama, and nothing nothing is hidden. All the way up to you know Kim Kardashian and her sex tape, the embrace of her embracing that, and then her family kind of embracing how they are, um, and showing that to the world, and the world in return being like, you know what? I appreciate that authenticity. I appreciate that realness, uh, which is also why I feel like Trump won uh, the first time, not because he was great, but because the the opposing force to those who wanted Hillary did not like uh, Obama, whether he was black or whether they felt like all the all the uh, suaveness and the smoothness was part of the politician uh, production production. Exactly. And they wanted they wanted something completely different. Uh, but they but one thing that I, I do know that this this 
in this culture that we're in is that they wanted something that they felt like was real and tangible. Yeah. Him saying some really uh, off the handle, off the wall, inappropriate things um, on on extremely big professional stages. Yeah. You know, oh, well, if I was president, I was running for president, I would say that. You know, that's mm. what I would say kind of thing. Right. And that that just seems to to show me that people do like the real people do like the authenticity uh the same thing why i think only fans is now doing so well <laughs> you know uh, i'm following you though yeah some people some people don't uh, always post nudes or lewd content mm-hmm. on their only fans and they're just trying to show uh themselves doing crazy things which is what snapchat and and instagram and vine and all these other things were trying to take place but only fans now just Monetize. strictly monetizes yeah. it um and i think that to or you know vlogs you see vlogs mm-hmm. and that's the same thing that they're trying to do uh trying to give people the real picture of who they are they're not uh they're not going for a fake thing and then if something if this person does something so long as it's not a uh, uh, sexually abusive or violent or racist, uh, if they embrace it properly, the crowd seems to not only forgive them, but rally behind them and gets other people to be like, you know what? This guy did this. He's had music come out. I haven't really liked it, but this guy did this. And then he did this to apologize for it. I really respect him for that. Let me, mm. let me give a listen, you yeah. know, see what he, what he's doing now. Yeah. I think I brought this up a couple, I don't remember which episode I brought up, but like the, just the concept concept of cancel culture Mm -hmm. and how I feel like, yeah, it can be toxic. It has its moments where it's intense, but I think it all has to do with how whoever the, the, whoever the, the, the focal point is, whoever the person is, the character who's, who's being judged. It's all how they handle it. Right. You know, they come off authentic and they're like no script. They're just in their house recording. So it's like, I don't know what, what was over me. Like I like genuinely like I, I don't plan on being in things, you know, for a stint, but like, I, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, I broke your trust. You know, like there's people that really bring it down and, or, or, or even the ones like, like a Z's where it's like, uh, it didn't happen. But like, I just wanted you to know, like, I wouldn't do that. You know, it's like, yeah. you're, you're already like apologizing and like, uh, cause you're freaked out because right. the, the, the pitchforks are coming. Um, but it's all how you handle it. It's all how, if you come off authentic, then it's, it, it's just, you're going to resonate, but you have to be, it's about how you're going to communicate yourself and it's going to be how about your, you, how you're going to defend yourself mm-hmm. or, or, or choose to attack yourself because right. you're like, Oh my God, like I did do that. And I hate that I did that. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's all because I just feel like maybe it's come with the the influx of media with the the information age of just having so much. I'm tired of things being curated to me, I'm tired of being told what to think, what, to, what I can tell. They're telling him what to say. Mm-hmm. They, they cut out that one part. He's reading the prompter. Tell. Yeah. He's like, he's not making eye contact with the camera, you know? And, and that's, it's, it's almost like a, like a biological thing, like a, like a, a, nat- a natural thing. You know, it's like in monkeys, like, you know, it's like, you don't make eye contact with the, the alpha male and, you know, there's, there's little nuances like that. And it's like the same thing. It's like, now we're like, why isn't he looking at the camera? Why do they keep cutting? Mm-hmm. Why is there a break? Right. You know, it's like they were just in the middle of the conversation. Why does there have to be a commercial break? Like exactly. nowadays it's getting more and more annoying to people or it's like, I don't, uh, I would pay more so you could remove the, the, the commercials from my show because I just want it to flow. Right. And it's not because you hate commercials. It's because you're realizing how it's being pieced together. Right. I don't have real life conversations where there's a commercial break in between whatever. Right. And back to, this is why we enjoy podcasts. Why podcasts mm. have become such a big thing is that there's, you know, even more so than radio. Cause radio, radio have been going more towards the podcast uh, style for for years now but you know radio interviews would be like oh yeah we're here with joe schmo blah 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 and we're here on the verb blah 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 and like all this extra bells and whistles to get people excited about whatever they're watching and now we're finding a new audience of people who are just excited with things that are the way they are because that's just how they are not because we've curated them to to be extra flashy and pop like yeah well and even even radio shows have the 
producers that will take the give present notes at the beginning or take notes like okay what are we going to say mm-hmm. okay we're not going to bring that up oh, what, yeah. what are you trying to promote today okay we'll find a way to bring that up casually yeah try to plug we'll, this you know we'll, we'll be in his ear so we'll we'll find a way to the segue into that don't worry about that um it's weird like uh have you listened to the willie d uh Joe Rogan episode came mm-hmm. out a few days ago. I did not listen to the Willie D. It's really good. Um, I all the, all the ones that every single podcast that Joe Rogan does is is pretty freaking good. Yeah, um, he's just such a good conversationalist. Except for the who is the one? Um, Alex Jones. Huh. No, Alex, man, Alex, it just shows just how great, the place. I think, man, Joe Rogan is such, so good at handling people with like huge personalities, oh, yeah. Yeah. uh, like Kanye and Alex Jones. Yeah. Um, I, who, the, the one, I think his name is Adam something. The one who, who does the, uh, uh, he does that show where he tells you the truth about certain things. Oh, Adam ruins everything. Yeah, Adam ruins everything. Mm. Yeah. And like, I don't think I've seen that one, man. It was, one. it was rough. It was rough for Adam because Adam ruined a lot of stuff on his show and it's, and you know, he presented himself as extremely knowledgeable, but then when, when tackled with somebody like Joe Rogan, who is extremely knowledgeable in a lot of different yeah, subjects, yeah. he just kind of, he folded. He didn't really know that much. Oh. Um, yeah. He, he, you know, he was like, well, my, for, for one thing, when they were discussing, um, trans, uh, trans, uh, like the transitioning uh, mm. from one from one gender to another, mm-hmm. people finding finding that they aren't really um, they were never supposed to be a woman when they were supposed to be a man, mm. kind of thing. Uh, and they were discussing um, letting kids go through the, mm. the transition. And Joe Rogan is discussing all these uh, statistics and like these these accounts of people who have gone through transitions uh, as children who didn't like it. And Adam was like, "Well, my trans friends." told me that if they could go through transitions that they would, uh, as a kid, they would have appreciated it more. And, and Joe Rogan's like, well, here we have all these statistics of how many people did not enjoy transitioning. Yeah. And just, it just seemed like, um, like he was the one person that I saw that didn't have true knowledge backing up mm. for why he was there on the show. Even watching Candace Owens, which, um, yeah, that one's interesting. Yeah, that was interesting, but she's, she's extremely knowledgeable except for <laughs> climate change. She doesn't know shit about climate change at all. She's just like, well, I just don't believe in it. Yeah, it's like, funny. it's happening. I'm sorry. You don't believe in it, but yeah, yeah. but she was versed in what she was. They, Everything else. About. Yeah, 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 exactly. But yeah, well, and again, I haven't seen that one now. I want to watch it, but I assume Adam comes off as a product. Mm -hmm. He comes off as, oh, you think I know everything. Right. I just ruin everything. I just ruin everything. Because they told me what to say. They give me the anti-facts and, you know, like, (laughs) yeah, I just recite them while things are going on, like the the freaking Old Spice commercials. (laughs) Yeah. Well, but that becomes obvious. I mean, like, you know, it resonate or didn't resonate with you. And you're like, all right, this, this is off. He's not in line with what I thought he he's come off to be, you know, in his perception. And, uh, and, and the reason why I brought up, um, the Willie D one is because there's a moment in the episode where he explains how he was, um, I think he was invited to like a radio show Mm. and it was just like a one-time thing, um, originally. And, but when he came on, all, all, it was like some late show. It was like a midnight to one o'clock, I think if if I'm remembering right, but it was like, when he did the show, they didn't talk about anything specific because it was a late show. There wasn't as many hands on it. So they just kind of talked about what was going on in his world and in the world in general, but it was very casual. Well, apparently like that had some of the, it had like 15% of the radio market like that night. Like it it had like some kind of crazy percentage. 15%. Yeah. Well, that's that's what he said. Um, and so he was like, he's like, well, this is crazy. And so they were like, he, he, he told them like he, he found out and brought it back up to the radio show. And they're like, yeah, you know, you want to come back out and you can do another one. And he's like, yeah, I'd love to. He's like, I think we should do this every week. You know, if we can capture that kind of audience, they're like, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And then they start talking to him about how it's going to be done and how, he, you know, cause I think this is late nineties. And so he says that he, he starts to prep for another one. And, uh, as he's sitting down and they're just about to start, they're like, okay, so here's a list of topics oh, we want no. you to bring up. Monica Lewinsky is the hot one right now. Uh, here's this one. Blah, 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 blah. And he's like, 
I don't want to talk about that. My people aren't talking about that. I'm not thinking about that. I don't want to talk about that. Yeah. Why do I have to talk about that? Why do I have that? to talk about that? And they're like, well, I just think it's, you know, it's, it's a popular po- you know, the topic right now. And I just think we would get more viewership. And he's like, but we got a lot more viewership already just by me being me. So I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> Why do we have to change anything if it's yeah. not broken, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm. And because and, he talks about that. He talks about how he started to understand that more, you know, of like radio production even the talk show stuff even he's just like what he's like why can't i just be me why are you telling me how to be me i thought we were talking not yeah 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 scripting and i think that's that's really starting i don't want to see it starting to come to a head like it's 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 an ending but i think it's starting to become less and less favorable with people that are attentive to that type of media of like i want general i mean not general genuine media Mm -hmm. i want this person to represent themselves and be about themselves know what they're about and uh, when i listen to their music that's that that is their vibe you know that is them um when you when you hear them in an interview or you hear their show or whatever it's like they they don't they don't change or they do because they learn new things and it's, you, you see it, you know, right. you, you, you interact with them by just being present in what they present. And, um, uh, this is different. It's a different kind of feeling because I don't know what, I don't know. It's almost like, you know, you listen to a really good live album and you hear different changes you hear Mm. little things that you're like oh that wasn't on the regular one right and you kind of like realize like oh you know this is them you even hear the mistakes yeah or or like oh they added that little finesse that was like oh that was awesome or like is that a choir this time that wasn't in the original and like and stuff like that and 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 because like me as a a music lover i mean that i love that alternative stuff because it i think and especially the live stuff because it feels it, it gives in that same vein of, of authenticity of it's like they they played it live they did it all in one go right it was it, it was a little bit different than what you thought and it wasn't you know yeah there's a lot of practice involved but it wasn't like you captured this clip stacked it on the track add these other things pieced it out worked out the formula and all this stuff and then released it and then that was it it was like here's a performance and it's just a different feeling you know right um but yeah i don't know that's just i think it's definitely coming becoming more and more important to people that appreciate forms of media whether it's video or audio doesn't matter i mean live performances of anything make the most money anyways Mm. yeah um I think YouTube's fantastic because you can you can record something that's live and then put it on YouTube and make money off of it. And therefore, it's like recorded live thing that you're making mm. quite a bit money off, which, which you can, I guess, say for any album, maybe not studio album, but like live album. Yeah, you could put a live album somewhere and then make money from the live album. But, you know, uh, I think YouTube does a good job at making sure that you can fully monetize to the to the fullest amount a live recording of something you can you can record that and then clips get a clip of something very specific and then make money off of that too Mm. um i think about the guy who does the um um what is it um white people aren't racist change my mind guy uh, the guy who goes to the, all the college, college campuses and says something extremely conservative mm-hmm. that throws off a lot of liberal students. And then mm-hmm. he uh, does these quick, like little two minute, three minute debates with these students mm-hmm. um, on camera and records them. And then if you if you have some somebody that has a crazy meltdown, you can clip that conversation of the crazy meltdown, upload that separately and make uh make some some like monetary stuff on it and that seems to have more effect that whole live thing like this actually happened that i think that's part of the the reason why people are attracted to it is that Mm. it's you know people are realizing wow this actually happened and they just happened to catch this on camera this is magic uh of course i'm gonna watch this and it's gonna it's gonna make me laugh or cry or feel a certain way even more because this is real this is not some scripted reality tv show there's right. no there's no goofy sounding strings in the background that's gonna yeah. make me feel like it's a surprise it's, it's like a billion stage lights behind them and someone telling them don't do that yeah exactly <laughs> i i'm right there with the other person in this video being just as surprised as this person was when this happened because i'm experiencing it live 
close to how this person was experiencing it. Yeah. And we're all now we're all about the real. We're all about mm. the real entertainment. Of course, we'll be we'll still watch the curated stuff. I still watch the curated stuff. Yeah. But um, I think nowadays live entertainment won't go away. It will just change how it's presented to the public now. Um, even studio recordings, like studio recordings don't make that much money be- just because they're so easily taken and like put here, put there, put there. But what will always make money is you going in person and seeing whatever is happening being right. created live. Even art galleries, uh, live paintings, uh, spoken word poetry, uh, musical concert, uh, sports, a real basketball game, football game, yeah. Olympics, you know, all seeing it in person happen before your eyes is always going to be the most popular preferred way of, of, uh, digesting anything new oh yeah yeah well and and in that same uh, line of thinking or in the same topic there's also the change of what streaming did to the monetary Mm. um flow destroyed it yeah to where you know you don't you don't really bank on that as much you know i think i i saw somewhere where you have to have like a million uh plays a month or something to make what would be equivalent to minimum wage or something Ooh, like that oh no. on Spotify. Oh no. And, um, and so I, I think this is changing things too, that people are becoming more aware of that. I don't know if that's like, they're just li- listening to interviews and listening to the artists vent about that or what. But, um, I mean, I'm definitely of this mindset of when, when I listen to someone, the streaming is almost more like a sampling, you know, mm. it's like, I want to listen to that. Oh man, I think that's a really good album. Especially with like COVID and stuff like that. Okay. Like I, I think I touched on this like on the last episode, but like when we got the stimulus and stuff like that mm-hmm. and it's like, we were okay. We were both working. Yeah. So I was like, you know what? I'm willing to, order stuff from the small record store. I'm going to order, um, you know, these small bands that I've been listening to this last year or so that are new that I know they're not going to be touring this year. They're, they're out of pocket. They've been blown out, you know, like random, random groups like, um, Holy hive and just all these people with small labels. Like, you know what? I'm going to go to your, your, your website. I'm going to buy your deluxe vinyl, whatever, and a shirt and cool, man. And it's like, I've got that, but I, I'm going to support you in that way because I understand that you're making money off the concert and merch for the most part. And the streaming is, it's, it's like the music selling has gotten, it's just dwindled because you don't need the, not as many people buy it anymore because mm-hmm. it's just free for the most mm-hmm. part. I can find it anywhere. Yeah. And I think that, I think if people stay in that lane of just appreciating the streaming and the freeness, um, there's gonna be a lot of people like that, but then there's going to be the people that will transition out out of, out of a form of pre- appreciation. It'll kind right. of evolve of like, you know, it's crazy. This is free. And then realizing like, is it, are they getting like, what are they, am I helping them? Like, yeah. you know, I'm giving them like a count, you know, a play count, but like, how can I actually support them? Like, cause I, cause you know, cause I'm, I was a, I'm a business dude. So, you know, I, I think of where my, my money's going, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, I don't, if I, if I'm going to order something, I'll go on Amazon, find out what I want. And then I'll go to that company's page and order it from them and wait a couple of extra days instead of two oh. days and make sure they get the hundred percent profit from it. And it's not cut out from, from under them because of Amazon or whatever. And, uh, sometimes when you tell them you're doing that, they'll give you a discount anyways, because they're just happy. Wow. Um, and, uh, because I do that in my business, like in the sign industry, I work with local people and I market that to people. I know I'm not the cheapest. I absolutely know that. But especially this year, I've been telling people like, I, I know I'm not always the cheapest. I'll always be as competitive as possible. But I just want to remind you, my stuff's not coming from China. My stuff isn't even coming from out of the state for most of the part. It's, it's metal fabricated stuff and stuff we made here. I was like, we're making it or, or a fabricator down the road that I know, you know, this is his family owned business. He made that, you know, you're supporting these people and, uh, immediately, you know, you're not paying for some millionaires next yacht. You're paying for this, this dude's groceries. Right. Um, and so I think about that in, in terms of the music industry and, um, like, 
because streaming has just really messed it all up, you know? Cause I mean, uh, I think Patrick Carney talks about that in that black keys episode where he talks about where even labels, cause I think it was Warner brothers was doing this thing where I want to make sure I'm remembering this right. It was something like if you, if we pair a digital album with each ticket sale, hmm. it will increase your streaming plays, hmm. but it'll con we're going to charge, we're going to take more from you on the front end or like something like that. Like yeah. they're, they'll be like, well, you'll get more out of the streaming if you do it this way, but because you're giving out the album already, we're going to take out like, you're not, we're going to take out 20% more of what you would have grossed from the concert. Right. Because, because we're giving the album out. Exactly. But we're getting your album out. So it's going to get played. So you're making money. And he's like, and, and they were just like, uh, but you're losing money. Yeah. It's yes. like, but that's not, that's not selling an album, mm. but they're like, but it'll count as an album right. sell. It's like, but that, we're not selling it. I'm selling the ticket. And then you're giving them a, a free digital version of it. Which and, they and, probably and, have already heard the album anyways. Right. And, and it's just like, I don't know. That's weird because it takes away that trajectory of support that you would give a musician. You know, it's like, Listen to them on YouTube or on, on some kind of streaming site. I go, oh, man, that's really good. I love that album. I love to pimp a butterfly. Yeah. Let's, I want to buy, oh, the vinyl's not out yet. I'll buy the CD. Oh, the vinyl's on pre-order. I'll buy that. I'll buy the shirt. I'll buy the, you know, what was this last time? Damn. You know, it's like, yeah. oh, I'll buy the damn shirt. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it's like, yeah, cause I, I love that album. You know, I, I sampled it. I experienced it. And now I want to go see him because I appreciate the art. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm there, I want a memento right. or I want to support like token, you know, something like that. You know, you, you either, you want something to remember it or you know what you're doing. You know that what you're, you're helping them, you're supporting them. And it's like, you know, you're repping them at the same time because right. you're going to put it on, you're going to wear it, you're going to show it. And, um, at the same time you, you gave a little bit of your, your own to them. And I mean, I hope it changes, you know, to where people understand that in music. Um, because I mean, I've always kind of thought of that because I had this, I, I had this, I've had this habit since like high school, whenever I go see a smaller band, um, play, if they were selling merch mm -hmm. and they had a record, mm -hmm. I would always buy it right? just because dual, dual purpose, memento, but also I knew what was going on. I knew that I, I wanted to, to help them. That's a great experience. I know I already bought the ticket, mm -hmm. but I'm going to throw down another, you know, peace because it, it's just, man, it just hit me. It just got me. And, and, um, I mean, I hope more more people realize that streaming isn't hitting it in the same way. No, no. I mean, I'm sure that they will, but the only people that are going to be able to do anything are the people that can afford to go to live shows. Oh, sure. You know, uh, most people that don't go to live shows that just stream music usually either are a f very fearful of going to live shows mm. uh because they just don't like being in in large big crowds. big crowds public places or you know they just don't have the funds to go yeah. um like even if you look at the the people who go to festivals you know mm. that's a lot of money to go to a festival um and those festivals compensate depending on you know what part of the bill you're on on the on the uh, on the festival uh, depends on your level of compensation uh, and usually the people that are going to be able to support you and and uh, fund your talent and at least show you uh, in a very uh, I'm gonna buy your product I'm gonna buy your merch or in a very financial way can support you are the ones that can actually come out to your live yeah. shows sometimes you have people buying from your digital website um, and supporting you that way and that's always a blessing too um, but, you know, un until then, I think Justin Bieber is going to be depending on 13-year-old uh, girls for a very, very mm -hmm. long time to, to buy his T-shirts and his posters and, mm. and such like that. Um, and if you can get a crowd to, to, to shell out $30 for a T-shirt at your, at your concert, you know, I think it makes it super worthwhile. Yeah. Um, local bands, you know, I still think um, local bands have a long way to go just because... Uh, 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 if you can always, if you can always see something all the time, the, the shock value or the appreciation of it goes down. So mm -hmm. local bands have a harder time selling a, a merch product, um, when they're at a local show, because most people are like, Oh, you know, either this is this local band and maybe this person I'm listening to that I, I like their music, but maybe 
you know, I'm wrong and I don't feel like repping this. I don't feel like paying 20 bucks. I don't feel mm. like paying 30 bucks because other people don't know who it is and can't validate my musical choices. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. It was but, a, it's a big rabbit hole. Yeah. I, I guess I don't know. I don't know if I'm, I don't want to say this sound, I'm trying to sound as humble as possible, but maybe I'm built different. Cause yeah. like in my mind, like I've always, like it's always been worthwhile to like, even when I was in high school, you know, like I want to go see, you know, Portugal, the man's coming to Granada mm. and whatever. And it's like, all right, cool. Uh, don't have a job. <laughs> um, but I have a bunch of comic books. So I'll, I'll take it to the bookstore, sell it, make 30 bucks. And then now I can buy that ticket. Yeah. I got the ticket, but I, I was always willing to compromise. Mm. Like I was always, I was always doing that though. Like, I, and I think maybe that's what it is, is, you know, like when I was younger, like I didn't, ha we didn't have a lot of money. And, and so I understood that I had to be clever. You know, if I got it, if I had a toy, but I hadn't played with it in a long time, I would find a way to sell it. Typically a comic book store was my outlet. Okay. And I would turn that in the funds to get something new. Holy shit. And, um, and then I realized, Oh wait, some toys are worth more than others. Some books are worth more than others. And so I'd be more particular and, um, and take care of them so that, you know, I never roughed them up. So when I need to resell them, they maintain their value or, or more. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I never, I never like conceded. I never like stopped. Like if I appreciated something and really wanted to support it or experience it go, I didn't let the finances always stopped me because I was either going to work to get there or I was going to sacrifice something that I had appreciated, but I'm willing to transition from, um, again, whether it was an old book figure poster or anything I could find to sell. I mean, I, because I've been a salesperson ever since I was five, but I was always in that mindset. And so by the time I got into high school and was more, yeah. Well, I guess the high school, I don't know if most people start going to concerts around that time, but I, I guess started so. seeing, seeing high school people at, at shows like 16, like 15 and up. Some people start going uh, at 14, depending on like yeah. what venues you like to go or what and genre sure your you parents like to go. Too. Yeah. Your parents, yeah. you know, your parents help you out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but yeah, so, I mean, that's, I, I mean, I was always in that, that headspace of like not negotiating, but just kind of like figuring out how to balance that. And it's like, I've always loved this book, but it's like, I'll always love it. I still remember it mm -hmm. and I know how to get it back. But this, it's like, I want to see this show. I want to experience this because I love this music so much. And, and I'm willing to sell that to get that. And it was just, I, I, you know, I've always just thought that way of like, I appreciate it so much. I want to sort through everything <laughs> to make sure I can st still make sure it's obtainable. What was the most difficult item you had to sell and what show did you sell it for? Mm. So in 2013, no, yes. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to go with that year. Cause I think that's what it is. 2013. Uh, it was the year after I graduated. Mm -hmm. Um, me and, m uh, my friend, Michael Bruner, we went to Bonnaroo. Okay. Oh, what? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. You know, it's a week long. You camp out there on a farm field and, mm -hmm. you know, it's farm water, sulfur treated water. And it's, it's an intense thing, but I mean, we saw everybody under the sun there. I mean, there is, I mean, we saw McCartney, um, I, Kendrick, uh, I mean, like I, almost anyone you could throw out and like, yeah, no, it's probably there. And, um, that, that was, I think, no, it was 2012. Cause I graduated, I graduated in 2012. I'm pretty sure we went the summer after that. Cause it was like my graduation kind of gift, but I didn't have money. I didn't have money. Michael had a job. I did not have a job. Oh shit. And, um, um, and that was at like the height of my like comic book reading. Um, also the height of my comic book selling game. Oh, okay. So, um, I had become apt to going to half prices, thrift stores, sorting through it and knowing the money, you know, I know the covers, you know, if I see that Batman number four twenty two, that's the death of so-and-so. If I see that blah, 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 that's the first appearance of so-and-so just cataloged in my brain. And, and I would just, uh, you know, pay a dollar for it, go sell it for 20. Mm. And, and I would just, I would sit on it. And, and like I said before, I'd always had this mindset of if I'm going to buy something, it means I'm investing in it. I'm not just 
taking it. I'm not just consuming something. That's food. Right. I'm buying something. I'm investing in it. And it better have a return on it in some fashion that's not completely negative. So even with my records, all of my records, um, especially the old ones, oh, yes. I bought them at a good price that I'll, I'll, I'll always be able to get at least that back. Mm-hmm. But I expect more. Right. Um, especially those ori- if you can get the original cuts or close to the original cuts. Oh, sure. Yeah. But that was that's that's always how I've seen anything I spend my money on. I guess outside of like production stuff because I don't know what that's going to be yet. But I could I know what those items are worth past past, present and future for the most part. Um, and so at that time I didn't have much money. I had some money cause I was already filming weddings and stuff, but mm-hmm. I wasn't charging a lot. I was charging like a hundred bucks or something. Cause it was literally like my first ones. Like Dang. it was rough. Like, wow. I mean, they were good, but like it was my first one. So I didn't want to like charge a billion dollars and then be like, Oh, <laughs> we just did that. Cause I didn't even have a demo yet. You oh, know, like okay. I was just like, here's one wedding I did, you know, I'll do yours for a hundred dollars just so I can keep putting on my tape. Man, you, you gave them the price of a lifetime. Oh yeah. hundred bucks. Wow. Oh. But I wasn't that good. Hundred, even even a not good. Just working a wedding in general. Yeah. Just you know, you can charge an arm and a leg. Like I, I play in bands, uh, like several corporate bands that play for weddings. Oh, okay. And like for the, like I have. Artemis Funk is an eight piece and you know, we charge a certain amount where you're like, okay, everybody in this eight piece can, can eat or buy groceries off of this one gig. Mm. If we're doing a pro gig where we're playing for three hours, but you know, I do a pro gig playing for three hours with like a 10 piece, 11 piece. And it's not that much, but like exponentially, you know, anywhere from like 10 to 20 grand for the band. Wow. And you know, like for weddings, most of the people who are, people are willing to shell out that holy moly number for the experience even if you're not that good no, yeah and honestly even yeah. if you're not that good yeah well and that was just me being careful yeah also my teacher had kind of freaked me out because he uh he well it wasn't my teacher he's like the ta he was um he came from that industry he used to do weddings, weddings. and stuff like that and so he was like you know watch out for those bridezillas and those really particular people and you don't want to make someone too pissed off because they'll never pay the second half of your deposit or you know Dang. whatever and I was like, oh, Jesus. Um, but anyways, um, so I wasn't making, that wasn't making me money yet. Not until college when I kept it up, was it, you know, paying bills or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but Bonnaroo was like, you know, it was like a few hundred for the plane ticket to Atlanta. And then we drove to Nashville. Um, and then the, t- you know, the ticket itself was a few hundred. And, um, and that's what I did. I sold books. I sold statues, just stuff that this is the other thing I used to do too. If I went to a bookstore and I realized they didn't know what they were doing. Like if I went in there, I'm like, why is this a dollar? Why is this entire box? that's $2 bo- comics or books, whatever. You know, why do they have this Hemingway book in here? Why do they have this thing? That's like, this is a nice book. Why are they only charging that? All right. I'm not going to pay for this. Go to my house, come back an hour later with books to sell to them. Like, hey, I have a stack of Batman books, whatever. They look through it like, okay, yeah, I'll give you 50 bucks. I'm like, okay, but how much in credit? I just want you to stuff that you have. And they're like, okay, um, I don't know. What are you thinking? I'm like, oh my God. Sometimes they would ask because they want to, they want to, they want to see where I'm at, you know? Am I stupid? Do I not know what I have here and I'm just hoping for something big? Because that's what they do. I know that's the game because that's what I do. Um, and so most of the time I would double it. I'd just be like, you know, can you just double it? Give me a hundred instead of 50. And most of the time they're like, yeah, cause they can already, cause I know what I had was already good and they knew it. And most of the time they would play, I'll play along, but then I'd take that hundred and I would invest half of it. And so I'd go back to that two hour box and I'd be like, oh man, buy the whole box. And then I'd use the other 50 bucks and buy a statue or something that would maintain its value. And it's, it's great. Cool. I'll just have it. It didn't, charge, it didn't cost me anything because I only spent $10 on that stack I just sold. And then um, I would take that stack of the credit that I a lot I got from them and I would take it to another comic book store, take out the name tag or the stickers, the, yeah. whatever price tags, and I would walk in and be like, hey, hey, here's a... Uh, Here's the entire series of Swamp Thing, the original series from issue number two through 18. You know, people only wanted the first one. The other one's, ah, $2, whatever. But some people, it has a cult following. Right. And it's an old book from the early 60s. And uh, I knew if I took it to the right shop that has that niche, they would pay more. So I took that 50 
that wasn't even real 50. It was their credit on top of what I would have gotten anyways. I was going to spend that money there anyways, even right. if they gave me 50 in cash. Mm -hmm. And now I take it to another store and then turn it into another hundred or something like that. So you take this like $10 comic book game and turn it to like a couple hundred mm -hmm. yeah. inside of a day. Wow. As long as I knew what I was doing. And, and so that's what I did. Like Bonnaroo, we knew the tickets were going to sell quick. And so... I think it was literally a weekend. Like I, I went to like, I went to a few half prices in my rink a dink beat up Honda Ooh. and, and found like a few little extra things, went to my catalog and got a few extra, went to the Duncanville bookstore, sold it, maybe bought some stuff, picked up some more stuff, went to Titan comics, sold it, went to awesome comics, sold other stuff. I'm like, all right, cool. And then come back I'm like, cool. Now I have $300. There's, wow. you know, there's the first half of the Bonnaroo ticket. And then tomorrow I'll go back and do it again and, and try and see what I can do. Jeez. Sometimes it wasn't always that effective, yeah. but, but in that scenario, since you asked that, that that's probably like the biggest move I ever did. Um, outside of literally moving cities and realizing like, I don't want to load up all these books. I'm just going to sell them. <laughs> I'm just going to sort through them and just get some money back right now. Smart. Um, but yeah, but see, but I've always been that way because I wanted to balance my passions. I wanted to always respect things without always feeling like I was left out, leaving mm. myself out from something right. because of my own decisions, you know? Um, but yeah, I don't know. So I feel, I hope that type of, um, appreciation stems out more to people that they're like knowing how their dollars are affecting people. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, with a podcast like this, you teaching them if they listen. <laughs> yeah. If y'all really want to go to these shows, y'all do what Russell does. Sell man. your just, shit. Just sell your shit. Hustle. <laughs> oh my God. Hustle. hustle. I, yeah. I, I was always um, satisfied, not because I went to a lot of shows, but because I played a lot of shows. Mm. So, you know, I was, I was the person on stage, whether it was in high school, was doing concert band or, you know, doing uh, orchestral stuff. And then when I got older, joined a punk band and we started doing yeah. punk shows and nice. um yeah that was i think that i mean i love artemis funk uh but doing the punk shows were probably the that was the first introduction to to doing shows but it's so much fun you know um uh, you know pre-covid era um moshing and mm. and doing house shows and and doing even the big stages like club dada or trees um and kind of seeing how that works. And, and it's always entertaining seeing the, um, of course, there's like 19, 20 year olds, 21 year olds who are there, 30 year olds. But there are also like 15, 16 year olds who mm. spent every single dime in their pocket, not necessarily to see me, but maybe see the, the touring band that we were opening for. And they would spend everything that they had just to go see this band and, you know, yeah. be as happy as could could be. For the experience. Exactly. So now it's kind of cool talking to somebody who, who has done that. Cause I, at first I, you know, I'm like, Oh man, 16, I'm not going to talk to a 16 year old. I'm mm. 22, 23, 24. Uh, but you know, it's good talking to somebody who's on the other side being like, yo, I, I did this, this, that to go to these concerts because I feel like, you know, we're all part of this ecosystem and making sure that they can do this for a while and they're yeah. compensated. And that's appreciated. Yeah. And, um, yeah, because I mean, I remember I went to some, I'm trying to remember the name of the festival. It doesn't exist anymore. It was like a small festival that popped up in Deep Ellum for like two years. It, it's called Index Fest. Index Fest? Yeah. Okay. And um, it was like in the, so you know, Trees has that big parking lot behind it. Mm hmm. It was literally in that parking lot. Oh, really? There was one stage on one end and another stage on the other end, um, if I'm remembering this right. Okay. And then there was a, and then they, obviously they performed in trees. So I think it was like three stage setup, whatever. That's tight. It was really cool. I'm yeah. very surprised it, it stopped. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> and, uh, I, I encountered so many musicians that I knew just walking around the grounds because it was tight. It's very small. Mm -hmm. And the food trucks were out in the center. So if they wanted to get something they had, they could go through. And that was another one. I think I think that was 2013. And it was another one where I didn't have a lot of money. Um, so I sold some stuff um, to get that ticket. Okay. It's like a hundred and something bucks or whatever. For, it was like a two-day, two, it was a weekend 
the uh, festival. You went to both days? Both days. Because, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you know, it's one of those deals where it's cheaper when you buy two, two yeah. you know, how it always is. Yeah. But um, but I had to do that. I had to compromise and, and sell something and get there. But it... I appreciated it. You know, I had to, I had to, um, my car wasn't working, so I had to get a ride there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had to work for it. You know, literally I was putting in this effort to, to go through this experience, right. but I wanted it. I wanted to go there and, and see, I remember who we saw, you know, washed out, uh, cold war kids, um, 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 Portugal, the man was there. Yeah. Um, and, but it was like, I, I was so stoked and I, it was like, you're not going to keep me from that. I'm going to sell the shit mm-hmm. so I can get to that seat, you know? And, and, and I loved it. And, and, and then walking through it and, and being a small setting and seeing some of those, you know, the Portugal, the man, the, the, the basis, Zach, and like I talked to him, like he walked by and I was like, are you Zach? And he's like, yeah, man. Yeah. Like, Oh shit, dude. It's like, I love your music, man. He's like, Oh, thanks dude. He's like, I gotta go, but it's nice. It's very like, nice to meet you. What the hell? I was like, it's just awesome. But as, as me unprepared for that, but had already put so much work just to get there. It was just like, Oh, that was amazing. Yeah. It's fantastic. I got my money's worth right there. Yeah. It was I mean, tremendous. Yeah. It was, and, and, and it's always been like that with me. I, 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 I've always, and I get that from my dad my dad has been a, a an, an intense music lover. Both my parents are, mm. um, but it just, there's always been that passion for music. It wasn't just, um, cause I don't, it, it, I mean, I think everybody appreciates music. There's levels of appreciation. Right. But I mean, it was like a ingrained, like passion, like, of just like, it's not just some other human, like, it's like this up there doing something that I could do if I mm. tried hard enough. Right. It was like, no, man, like this guy has put in this effort. There's a lot of background stuff to just outside of what we're seeing right now. Right. And I appreciate the hell out of it. And I, I understand that it wasn't just monotonous work. It was creative. It was, it, it was, he was pushed. They were, they pushed themselves in some way. There was something, you know. It was just such a, um, cause like I said, the point of this, con- the, of this podcast is I, I like genuine conversation. I like seeing genuine passion out of people Sure. and, and, and that's what it is. Mm-hmm. That's what it was all. Every time I, I experienced a concert, every time I saw a live performance, even if I didn't know who it was, it was just palpable. I was like, wow. It's like, it's almost like you get, you get a feeling of who this person kind of is without knowing them. You know what I mean? Right. But it was just. I don't know what it is. I've always been obsessed with that. And it's always been worthwhile, you know, to invest in. Good. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure after this, uh, after the vaccine comes out and uh, people feel more comfortable going out, I think there will be a rise in live show attendance now mm. because uh, people have now gone through what it's like to not be able to participate that. And, right. And I don't think, you know, a lot of people who enjoy music, don't really, you know, they're like, yo, okay, maybe I chose not to go to these live shows, but now you can't, you're saying I can't now I'm gonna go to right. all the live shows as right. soon as I can, because life is unpredictable and I don't want to yeah. miss out. Well, it's like me and our band, like, you know, when we couldn't see each other for months, mm. that was the, when we came back together, it was the most dialed in we had been in a long time. Right. Just because he took the rug out from under us. He took out the safety blanket mm-hmm. like, Hey, 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 wait a second. We were going to do this tomorrow. Yeah. What happened to tomorrow? I don't know what tomorrow is anymore. Oh, jeez. Then you hear it. I need some control down. over my life. Uh, I need yeah. to, I don't like where I'm at right now. You know, and I think that's what this, this, this situation has really done to people. It's made them appreciate what they have. But it's also kind of shown what you've built. Right. You know, it's like, where are you right now? Especially young adults where you've, 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 you've gone long enough to where you've made your own decisions. You know, you, you're with this person you're with, you're in this place that you want, you're working here because you X plus Y plus Z and here you are. Now you're kind of, I mean, hopefully a lot of people are doing this. You're, di- you're digesting that. You're realizing right. like, who that was me, mm-hmm. you know, or like, Oh, I could have done something to not be in here or whatever. And, and yeah, I hope it, this, this really shakes up dynamics in a lot of ways oh, and everything, yeah. everything socially of just realizing how much you should appreciate the things that are beautiful <laughs> because if, you don't know when the, how it's going to last. If this does not spur on a renaissance in, in the individual, mm. then I don't know. Okay. I don't think anything else will. This is like, mm. you know, active, no, active. No God. internet. No. Oh, uh, well, you know, <laughs> 
<laughs> you want to see anarchy. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's what we'll get with no internet anarchy. Either that or people will be, you know, they'll just get into books or get into something mm. very specific, get better, become better cooks. But I definitely feel like something, um, such an event that affects the entire world, uh, in such a way where it takes away things that we, we all took for granted. I, I believe that Every single person, including myself, took something for granted that um, being able to walk out of your house without a mask uh, mm. offered. And I, you know, the attitudes of people that you converse with now um, during this this whole COVID era. And we, I'm hopefully hopefully we're seeing kind of the end of it. But the, the conversations that we have with these people or people have with people is like, man, like I can't wait until I'm able to go outside. Yeah. I can't wait. I'm so excited to go do things yeah. and do go crazy and go wild. So, you know, uh, you know, not have this mask on, be able to talk to my neighbor, go to these restaurants yeah. and not, and I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm looking forward to the future, you know, 2022. Um, I don't know if 2021 is going to be the year where we're out and doing yeah. things, but 2022, 2023, I'm looking forward to the rest of the twenties of this 2000 era. Yeah. And, uh, I'm excited. They better be roaring. Oh my God. They better be roaring. We better be wearing <laughs> flapper dresses and, you know, like doing the whole thing. Marijuana better become re, uh, legalized. And I think they're about to vote on that, aren't they? Who's, it's, but well, oh, it's uh, being presented to the house. Oh, as I a think. federal thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Ah, Texas, you have no choice soon. Either that or we, we're really seceding for real. Um, but I, I'm, I'm hoping they, they get it through. Yeah. That's, I'm that's very, I'm very interested. Interest. I mean, everybody's interested in the future. <laughs> sure. Everybody's interested in the future, not just marijuana, it's but the future mind. itself. But yeah, but yeah, but what this is like shaken up, you know, and, and, and what people have realized, like, like again, kind of what I was touching on, how much you should invest in yourself, how mm -hmm. much you should invest in the future and treat your future self as like your best friend, you know, looking right. at your future self as like, you're not just going to be me when I'm 30. You could be me when I'm 30 and you know how to play this instrument. Mm -hmm. well, how'd you fucking do that? Mm -hmm. Do that. Why aren't you doing that? Yeah. You know, and it's like the more and more you're restricted from doing these passion projects or things you really want to do. And just, I mean, I hope it spurs something out of you better, you know? Um, but yeah, I agree. You know, I, I don't think, uh, cause my uncle, he owns a event company and, uh, a couple of restaurants. Okay. Um, Around here or? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Maybe it's just one restaurant. Yeah. Um, in Dallas, in downtown Dallas. Okay. Um, what's the, what's the restaurant? The restaurant's called the artisan. The artisan. I feel mm -hmm. like I've seen that. It's like, it's on the, um, it's a, it's attached to the KPRG building. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's on the terrace is what it's called. That's tight. It's a, it's a beautiful spot. Um, but anyways, he's been kind of like my barometer of like where things are and how things are going because, mm -hmm. you know, his hands are like tied behind his back. He can't run those events. He, you know, he has a catering company too. Okay. Um, he can you know, all this stuff is like dwindled and, and so, um, oh, and he told me about this. Like, did you know, like Ticketmaster and like Live Nation and all those people, how they've like furloughed like 98% of their people really and they're they'd said that they're not expected to bring them back to like next june oh in 2021 yeah i'm not surprised yeah, yeah. but but my, my uncle he keeps saying that most people in that industry in that world that can't that plan and schedule for that stuff events that that's what that's their that's the month they're looking at <laughs> that normality beginning to cycle back mm -hmm. and next june we saw it this past year uh things started opening up in summer which in return, uh, became, came a second wave of COVID. Yeah. Uh, but this time, hopefully entering 2021, June, we will have a vaccine yeah. out on the market for people to take. Yeah. And just a general, better understanding of how it works with certain people and better therapeutics, cheaper therapeutics, mm -hmm. you know, testing has already gotten cheaper and yes. more accessible and it just takes time, you know, mm -hmm. and that's what I bring up to anybody that has a problem with all the things in place, you know, right now, whether it's a mask or whatever, occupancy levels being changed, certain things being closed, whatever. It's it's all about mitigation. It's about slowing down this novel thing that we don't know that we're learning more about, and uh, that's all it's about. If and and it's like, um, what's that quote from Futurama? If we do it right it won't really seem like we did anything at all. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, it's like if we, if we're safe, 
it'll it'll slow it down and it will make it seem like it's not a big of a deal but it's because we've taken all these precautions to mm-hmm. slow things down and um so anyways yeah so i know it's working and it'll eventually we'll phase out oh yeah we'll learn to live with it but it's just um weird pains we're growing pains <sighs> in a lot of ways for our society definitely something that we don't experience i feel like um asia asia has a good job at at slowing down uh, uh like uh, whether it's the flu virus or anything that hits asia you know they 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 have been publicly wearing masks in public for a long, as yeah, long as I can common. remember. Yeah, yeah, it's very common. And, you know, uh, the fact that we as Americans uh, have had so much um, revolting against mm-hmm. this or, you know, oh, well, they're trying to control us or uh, this is you're ruin, you're controlling my God given right of, yeah. of not going around. You're trying to muzzle me kind of thing. Yeah. Like all I don't know. But we also live in a very conspiracy theory heavy nation as well. Well, everyone has a mic nowadays. Yes. Yeah. We all have platforms. Even me. Yeah. Even Mr. Russell Romo. You know? Sam Romo. Sam Romo. That's my name for the show. Are you serious? Yeah. Sam Romo, everybody. I'll edit it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ru- I'll put a, Sam Romo. I'll put a bleep over my real name. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, man, I don't know. I'm, I'm very, I'm optimistic because I do think this will stem a different form of appreciation in a very, you know, consumer centric you know, society of like, just like, just, you know, like companies just constantly grow, constantly grow. It's like, well, wait, something might take the floor out from under you. Maybe Mm -hmm. you should be careful about who your managers are because if they don't know what they're doing and they don't know what their team is doing all the time, uh, when we have to let go 20% of the workforce and they're having to do what their team used to do, they're not as efficient. Right. So maybe he shouldn't be a manager anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm seeing like, it's like a burnt forest. You know, it sucks. It's gone. It's damaged, but it comes back stronger. Yes, it does. And it comes back stronger because it's, it's refertilized in the remnants of what we've realized, what we were are realizing like, this wasn't as put together as I thought it was. Let's fix this and that before Mm -hmm. this happens again. And, And I'm hoping it comes back you know, I think it will in, in, in business and just in anything, any form of interaction in our society that people just appreciate a little bit more. Um, whether you, you didn't like how things were handled or not, when things go back to normal, we all should be happy. So we should be, (laughs) Yeah, we did, we did just go through a whole election process with a brand new president. So now, now we have a new, new, head of state or head of government and uh hopefully everybody is satisfied by the time we're able to go out and uh and do things i do think biden's gonna kind of not put a chokehold on things but uh really enforce social distancing and and Mm. slowing down this pandemic whereas trump was like look what they did to new york look look what they look what they did to it blah blah blah. not um not look what my negligence uh did to two hundred thousand people in this nation yeah Yeah. stick stick to the scientists stick stick to the doctors what are they telling you to do yeah right yeah i don't know these people and when it comes to any new administration on the government level state level (laughs) even a city council whatever um I like to think about um, George George Bush's letter to um, Clinton when he took over the office at the end of his little gr- greeting letter, you know, little pass on letter to him congratulating him, stuff like that. At the end of it, he has a statement that says, um, I'm rooting for you because your successes will be America's successes. And that's all you got to think about. That's all you got to think about. You know, when we're in a binary political system of one side or the other, and if you're on that side, then you're wrong. No, you're all Americans. Mm-hmm. You get along, mm-hmm. you know, and and just focus on the successes. Be critical of the failures and learn. Yeah, and that's all you can do. That's what I'm hoping for. Don't make it simple. <laughs> it's never going to be simple. Mm-hmm. And and just yeah, never feel like you're at odds with someone that you're, you probably have more in common with than you have less in common with. You know what I mean? There's probably more you could get along with rather than sticking on one topic that's going to ruin things, you right. know, and, and to be, just to be open and 
Yeah, I don't know. I'd watch out for the open thing, man. I'm tired of having a president who has a Twitter, Twitter fingers, just being able to spout out everything that he thinks at, that the, was t- weird. at the time. Yeah, that's awful. Very weird. It's very, very not profe- not professional. I can't believe I'm saying this about the president of the United <clears throat> States. Like, that wasn't very professional, President Trump. Like, that's why like a lot I, of people say it's like I would have gotten fired if I was tweeting this often exactly. when I was on the job. <laughs> I, you know, I work for a bank and we have like a social media clause where we really can't go and mm. like talk about you know, the company that we work for and it's in our contract oh, when, we, wow. when we start working for them. So I'm, I'm, I guess the U S government never experienced social media on this level before, but I know like Obama had a freaking flip phone. Oh yeah. Yeah. And a flip phone. Yeah. But yeah, it's evolving. There's going to have to be things put in place, you know? Um, yeah. No, no, dude. It's yeah, weird. Yeah. No more Twitter fingers. <laughs> no more. So anyways, jazz. Yeah. Jazz. <laughs> Jazz, man. <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's all over the place, everywhere. Like podcasts and, you know, it's so free. Well, we need to, um, how long has this been going? Like maybe an hour and a half, two hours. Yeah, two hours. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe we should do another one in, uh, at some time and, and pick an album. Okay, I'd yeah. Like to do that for sure. Absolutely. Let's pick yeah. a freaking album. Yeah, for sure. Because that's going to be the, the thing I'm going to be working on next. I, I'm going to try and do as little as possible by myself. Like, this is a singular review. Um, my thing I really want to kind of incorporate as the main or one of the main uh, niches of the show will be conversational album reviews. Okay. I'm just taking it track by track and just, you know, sharing the knowledge of the background or just the relation of the track to you or to other artists or the influences or just, you know, what, what did it, what, what vibe, you know, what did it feel like to you? Let's explain it. Let's just have an open review of the album. Let's both, you know, listen to it, make our own little notes or whatever, and then come together and talk about it. I'm definitely excited about the white album review since that's my favorite Beatles album. So yeah, dude, you know, I'm excited too. Yeah, got me into the Beatles. Oh, really? Yeah, that whole album. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? That's funny. I think that kind of solidified me as like a real, or or that that took me to the the depths of the Beatles. Mm-hmm. It's like I always knew. My parents always played the the hits, but then one day my dad bought like when they re released albums on CD, mm-hmm. he bought the White Album. That was the only one he bought, but he bought that one. And then when I listened to it, I, I never I only heard I don't know which one I like uh, Blackbird. I think that was the only uh, one. And I played it all the way through, and I was like, what the hell? Yeah. There's like heavy stuff. There's this light stuff. There's this bungalow bill story song. There's this Rocky Raccoon story song. It's just all over the place. It was crazy. Um, and that's what showed me the variety, you know, the complexity of what they, they could be or what they were. Um, but anyways, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to that. That'll be next week. Okay. Okay. All right. Then I'll be, yeah, I'll definitely be tuning in. Awesome. Yeah. But yeah, man. I can't wait. Well, in the meantime, go we'll over some albums that you would want to talk about maybe sometime. Mm, I can't wait for that either. Yeah. Yeah. There's, so, like, we only get one album, right? I mean, we can do multiple. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I won't tie your hands behind your back. Yeah, good, good. I'm not a producer. Yeah, right. I mean, I am, but I'm not going to act like one. We're not going to script this. (laughs) We're not going to. Let's cut that out. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Yeah. Sounds good, brother. Yeah. Awesome. It's been great. Yeah, this has been fun. Awesome. Thank you for having me, and thank you for inviting me to your beautiful home. Thanks, dude. I I don't know if y'all can see it. Y'all probably can't, but it's a beautiful home. It's a beautiful spot to be in, so thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Glad you can make it. Yeah. Be happy to have you back. Okay, cool. Awesome, brother. Cool. Cool. Thank you for listening. For more episodes, visit our website, musicmythpodcast.com, and follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Goodbye. <laughs>